going to talk about two things today. This is kind of a double header about natural language processing and uh, reinforcement learning. This is kind of how things worked out a little bit, is that you got squeezed. I wanted to do these two as two separate lectures, but um, we're kind of running a little short on time, so I decided to just give you the executive summary of both, let's call it. And um, it should be pretty fun because we're going to take a high level view of both of them. And so we're going to see a lot of like really cool projects and then we'll see some practical stuff as well. Um, we're getting close to projects, so I don't expect that this will necessarily be useful to you before then, but it may be. And I know at least a few people are, are already kind of on this track. Um, so, well, okay, so let's just start by showing this video, um, which I really love this video. I showed it in my last class. There's this subculture of kind of making like the hardest possible levels in, in like Super Mario games. Yeah, listen to this. So what's going on here is that like um, Mario is basically invincible. Like you've never seen anyone play Mario like this before. And we're basically going to be talking, when we get into reinforcement learning, this is, this is going to become very relevant because we're going to be talking about like unstoppable game playing agents. And, yeah. Yeah. And, and also like, just have a, like really take a moment to appreciate the creativity that goes into this Mario agent. Like he comes up with moves that like you as a Mario player, no matter how good you are, you would never think them up. This is my favorite one right here. It's just cheating death, right? So, <laughs> so yeah, this video is relevant because we're going to be talking about game playing agents and, um, in particular, creative game playing agents. And yeah, well, this is really sort of like okay, we've gone too far with this. It just get it just goes on like this basically for you know it gets really fast towards the end. So I don't <laughs> I don't think we want to keep up with it. Anyway, um, so back to real life. Um, I, just a few like admin things I want to I want to mention. Um, so final projects are coming up, which is very exciting to me. Um, I'll I, I want to um, start to meet with you with everybody. Like I'd I'd love to like uh, I'll be basically like um, you know be here mo more or less every day until until the uh, projects with like a couple of small exceptions. And so I'd love for everyone to come visit me and tell me what you're working on, what you're struggling with. Uh, maybe if you have some um, ideas for, for e even if it doesn't have to do with your final project, it might be interesting just to talk about future projects. I know also there's the ITP show coming up, so maybe um, you might have some questions that are relevant to that. So that's uh, the first thing to mention. Second thing is, um, and a few people have already asked me about this, but we'll say that, um, so December 11th is when everyone's showing uh, projects. Uh, however, um, I'll make it an option that if, you, if you'd like to be extended until the end of the week, um, so that you can bring it to me, let's say on Friday or ideally Thursday, because I might not be there on Friday the 14th, uh, that is an option. So like if you don't want to present during class, that's, that's entirely okay, but we'll say that by the end of that week, um, projects are due. Um, except under exceptional circumstances, so just let me know about that. Um, and, and you don't have to think about it right now, I'll talk to you guys individually. Um, and uh, hopefully most people show you know, during the 11th, because then it's always nice to get some feedback from your, from your peers. Um, but like I said, it's, a, it's an option for you. Uh, this week's office hours, I'll be here tomorrow between 12 and 6, although I'll, I'll be here today also, so like if you, if you do want to meet after class, like let me know, I'll just be in my office. Um, and then tom tomorrow, uh, sorry, Thursday, uh, same thing more or less, except I'll just be at the ML5 meetup between 1 and 2.30 or 3. Um, so at that point, um, but, but we can say like, like right after that, uh, office hours will be um, on, the, on the docket. And then, um, let's see, so Friday and Friday I'll be here like from 12 to 5, let's say. And uh, this week's AI lab will be the last one because um, uh, next week I'm actually going to be leaving on Friday. I'm going to Montreal for, for uh, NURIPS, formerly called NIPS uh, Festival. Um, still getting used to saying that. Um, but anyway, that's, I'm going to be in Montreal um, like probably from early Friday. So, if you, um, so we probably won't have an AI lab that week. Um, we've already done small glow and big gan tutorials, but I, I was thinking to show a maybe more in-depth one. I have some new tricks. Um, actually, you can see that in the next slide. There's some new tricks that are inside the notebooks. 
Um, this one on the right here was basically uh, demonstrated by uh, Philip Isola, who came up with CycleGAN, and he figured out a way to make these, these uh, big GAN generators spin um, in the Z space, and so he put some code up there, and I'll, I'll show you how to use it. And then you might recognize some of the people in this image. Um, this is uh, some Glow stuff. I, uh, we, I, I did show this, um, what was it, two weeks ago, I guess, but um, if you want a little bit more in-depth on how to set it up and install it and so on, um, we'll make that AI lab this week. Um, okay, so we're doing two things and we'll split it into halves basically. So the first half we're going to talk about natural language processing and then we'll get into reinforcement learning. Uh, natural language processing, henceforth known as NLP, um, is basically the science of trying to get computers to understand natural language, text, in text form. Um, it's usually distinct from things like uh, things like speech to text, let's say, are not really considered part of natural language processing. Um, that's that's kind of you know audio processing. Uh, natural language processing deals with in text form language, human language generally, and it's trying to understand it, quote unquote, uh, in order to perform tasks that are useful to us. So like some applications are things as easy as simple as like spell checker, right? Okay, straightforward spell checking is an NLP application. Uh, machine translation, so translating uh, from one language to another. Uh, then there's kind of like a, a family of predictive analytics, let's call it, like sentiment analysis, extracting uh, keywords from, um, from sentences, uh, a task called named entity recognition, so detecting when things are named entities or names, proper nouns, let's say. Um, and then related to that is, uh, and a bit higher up the chain of understanding is, things like reading comprehension and parsing semantic information uh, or like relational information. So let's say you get a paragraph and you, you have a sentence like, um, Alice has a box which is colored blue. And then, you know, uh, can you get a machine to figure out all the relations between the, the entities in, the, in those sentences so that you can answer questions about them? Um, so what color is the box or things like that? Uh, then there's things like summarization, so being able to, or paraphrasing, let's say, being able to take large blocks of text and distill them into their most relevant summaries uh, is, of course, also a big topic. We want to be able to make the news automatically, so that's, that's coming. Um, then things like spam filtering, of course, everyone's familiar with that, trying to detect when, um, you know, emails are very sketchy and, you know, weeding them out. Then uh, chatbots, question and answer services, of course, everyone's familiar with those these days. That's a, also a really big topic and, uh, and very much at the heart of natural language processing, making, making agents that can, can speak uh, to us, answer questions, be our friends, you know, like, uh, <laughs> well, anyway. Um, uh, and then, oh, and then duplexes. I should really show this. Uh, I think I may, might have shown this in one class before, but I don't know. Google um, released this a few months ago where they, they described, uh, they, they combined their sort of natural language processing agents and um, their uh, wave nets in order to make basically people on the phone that sound, that, or AIs on the phone that sound like people but and totally fool other people. So here's a, an AI, <laughs> let's call it, scheduling a hair salon appointment. Listen to this. So how can I help you? Hi, I'm calling to book a woman's haircut for a client. Um, I'm looking for something on May 3rd. Sure, give me one second. Mm-hmm. Sure, what time are you looking for around? At 12 p.m. We do not have a 12 p.m. available. The closest we have to that is a 1.15. Do you have anything between 10 a.m. and uh, 12 p.m.? Depending on what service she would right like, there, what right. service is she looking for? Just a woman's haircut for now. Okay, we have a 10 o'clock. 10 a.m. is fine. Okay, what's her first name? The first name is Lisa. Okay, perfect. So I will see Lisa at 10 o'clock on May 3rd. Okay, great. Thanks. Great. Anyway, have a great day. Bye. Like, if you think telemarketing is bad now, you just wait like a few years before everyone has their hands in this technology. It's like you won't even know if you're talking to. Well, it's get, it, things are going to get really hairy, I think. So anyhow, um, so yeah, like everyone's going to have our own personal assistants. You know, they're going to be able to, to schedule, make scheduling appointments for you and, you know, order pizza from restaurants and things like that. 
Um, so lots of interesting things to look forward to. Um, now, why is natural language processing so hard? Um, that's kind of, uh, the, okay, well, we'll take a look at this sentence. This is kind of a, an example that Jeffrey Hinton likes to use. So here's two sentences. The trophy doesn't fit in the suitcase because it is too big. The trophy doesn't fit in the suitcase because it is too small. So it, it, you know basically by instinct that the it in both of these sentences refers, in the first one it refers to the trophy, in the second one it refers to the suitcase, right? So sentences are packed with, uh, the way we speak is packed with so much ambiguity and uh, we take for granted just how much processing we do subconsciously to understand the meaning behind uh, what is being said to us, right? And in language, there's really like a lot that's buried underneath the signal, right? There's all this cultural uh, information that's relevant, like connotation and denotation. You know, you have two words that may mean the exact same thing, but, um, but you know, it, one might have a negative connotation, one might have a positive connotation. So there's really just a lot uh, that we're doing with language that is very much beneath the actual signal of the words themselves. And that is really, really difficult for, you know, computers to understand. Uh, and so NLP has been like a pretty difficult task for, for many, many years. And that's partially the reason why we've seen much more progress in things like computer vision, because language processing is, yeah, it's pretty hard. But starting around 2015, uh, uh, deep learning began to kind of, uh, as Chris Manning said, the, the deep learning tsunami hit NLP for the first time. And it's been really, really actually making really fast progress over the last um, couple of years, particularly this year. There was actually like a lot of very important milestones reached this year, which we'll, which we'll see in the slides later, that uh, make it very much the case uh, that we're probably uh, like rapidly improving this field. Um, now, let's start by talking about representation of language, right? In all of our computer vision units, we talked about how we're able to use neural networks to project images, those very, very low level, very noisy um, data points that are full of nothing but pixels into more meaningful, high dimensional uh, feature vectors, right? You know, that, that look maybe kind of like this, right? And um, those were useful for us because we could do well, we could do a lot of transfer learning tasks from them, right? Once you have a, a, a nice representation as a data point of an image, then uh, pretty much all of the tasks that we do start by doing this, by representing the image as some, some vector of features. And so ideally we'd be able to do the same thing for words, right? And it's not exactly clear uh, off the bat how to do that, right? Because words are not full of pixels. There's no bits, they're, they're just, you know, um, I mean, you know, maybe you can think of them as a sequence of characters, but and that's what char and n does, but it turns out that that doesn't actually work that well. So how can we uh, project words into feature vectors? Um, so let's take a step back and just remember what this idea of embedding is, because we've been kind of talking about it indirectly for basically the entire term. So when we uh, extract features from images, we're essentially embedding them in what we often call a latent space. And the latent space is kind of this, this space where each dimension in that space corresponds to meaningful sort of high level feature modulations, right, let's say. And um, the geometry of that space is actually uh, important. So there's relationships between images or whatever data points are projected into the spaces. We'll, we'll say that they're contextually similar if they appear near each other. So, you know, in this case, B and E, right, are, are close to each other, and so therefore they must be they must be similar in some sense of the word. Uh, and then the actual vectors themselves between points are relevant as well, and they often denote some sort of a feature transformation, right? And we've seen this a, a million times, like when we talked about DC GANs. In DC GANs or in GANs in general, um, you can modulate the the latent vector by adding some feature vector to it, the add glasses to it vector or add blonde hair to it vector, right? Um, and this was relevant in Glow too, um, when I was showing you those, those facial, uh, what do you call it, facial projection demos. So um, we've seen this a lot with images, right? And um, so, you know, this is sort of an image imbe images embedded in space. The dogs are very close to each other. Um, the, you know, you can embed audio into space as well. And then uh, we can also do this for text as well. This, these slides are kind of out of order. Uh, I should probably show this first. 
well okay uh yeah okay like let's say so something like projecting words into space you know would look something like this right and you, you we can see that queen duke and king terms of royalty are relatively near to each other and then also you see that the vector between woman and man is the same as the vector between king and queen and king because there's these relationship vectors um that uh that are also you know ideally manifested in the in word vector space so here's a little toss-up question where would the word duchess be right well if duchess is the female version of duke it should have the same vector between it and duke so duchess would be some somewhere like there um yeah let's actually let's, let's back up a little bit we're not gonna uh <laughs> i don't really have a great visual for this but i'm gonna try to explain in just like two minutes how word vectors are 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 uh word feature vectors basically are, are figured out. Um, there's, there's multiple ways of doing them, right? But they all involve basically deep neural networks. And the idea is that, look on the right side first, the skip gram model. So you start by saying that all of your words are, let, let's say you have 1,000 words in your vocabulary, right? And that's, that's actually really small. Typically, like the English language is something like uh, 50,000 words in common usage or something like that. Uh, but Suppose that you have 1,000 words in your vocabulary. Then at first, the best you can do is represent every single word as one hot vector. So like uh, the word aardvark is, you know, is 1, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, and so on, right? The word ant is 0, 1, 0, 0, 0. Basically, one index represents every single word, right? Now, of course, that would mean that your, your, in, your, your input vectors are absolutely enormous there you know if it's if you have 50,000 words in the English language and it's 50,000 elements in your one hot vectors so that's not ideal and also it, it's not a very good representation because it doesn't capture relationships between words you know like different words are very similar cat and feline are very similar right so they should have a similar representation so the idea is that you can actually train a, uh, a, a, a you can you can derive word vectors by training it, by training a neural network to do some natural language task. And frequently, it's something like predicting the next word. So if you look at skipgram, I wish I had my mouse here. It's not, maybe if I, no, I just can't get it back. Okay. Um, yeah. So basically, uh, the idea is that your input layer, the first layer there is, you see it's V, v by one. You input the the okay. So let's say you have a corpus of text where it's just it's just some it's Wikipedia, right? So you can iterate through Wikipedia where you take each word and then you take either the next word or the next and the previous word or some context window around it. And the goal is to try to predict the context words from the from the current word. So in the sentence. Um, the boy is playing baseball you want to predict is from boy and then uh, baseball from playing and so on or maybe you want to predict the next three words or something like that basically and the idea is that you input the actual one hot vector and then there is this hidden layer which has n elements and what that hidden layer is actually going to be is it's literally going to be eventually it's going to be the uh, the word vector associated with that word and the way it works is that you have this this weight matrix that's v by n right there's our vocabulary is v and our uh, the amount of dimensions we want in our word vectors is n let's say it's a hundred or something and though that contains it's a gigantic matrix that contains all of the word vectors for all of the words and if you yeah I don't I don't want to belabor the details but if you write this out you'll see that like if you use one hot vectors then when you do a neural network like a sum multiplication all of the word vectors for the irrelevant words just get multiplied by zero and so they get cancelled out and so what you end up with is just the uh, word vector for that input right um, if this is flying over your head it's not really important i just want it like just for completeness sake I, I want to, uh, and you, you can look this up. It's it's actually like well well understood. I'll also I'll I'll tell you like a, a good a, later at the end I'll tell you where you can um, like take a good class about natural language processing that'll explain all this stuff in more detail. In any case, like um, 
you, we once you like you're training next word prediction and, and really like you can train it to do almost anything like it could be trained for any natural language task and very frequently the word vectors are trained in the process of a particular task so like uh, when we did text to image and image to text the word vectors for those are actually trained as part of the process that does the text to image or image to text it doesn't have to be next word prediction it can be basically anything um, and that's actually one of the big lessons of deep learning. You train, as we, as we say, you train end to end. You train, uh, you don't just train the word vectors and then, and then apply them to the task. You actually train them as part of the task. And, and well, we'll see that you don't necessarily have to do that because transfer learning is actually really useful as well. But, um, but that's basically like something that you'll see over and over. There's kind of two ways of doing this and they're, they're basically inverses. There's continuous bag of words, CBOW, where your input vector is, is like a series of words, consecutive words, and then your output is you know, the next word or the target word. And then skipgram is just the other way around where you have an input word and then some context uh, around it. So yeah, <laughs> that's how word vectors are basically trained. Um, and what happens is you get all these really interesting um, geometric relationships. Now we already talked about king and queen, duke and duchess. Um, you, there, there's of course the gendering vector, but then there's also things like as mundane as verb tense, right? So you go walking to walked, swimming to swam. You get country capital relationships, right? There's a, a vector between uh, every um, country and its capital city. Uh, there's name naming vectors, you know, like last name to first name of celebrities, let's say. Um, there's all sorts of interesting relationships that you can find and um, those become very important later on when you when you start to actually use these as part of tasks and they're interesting in their in their own right actually uh, let's quickly look at the ml5 uh, js uh, word vector demo and actually let's just do it in the real browser um, where is it here okay so if you go in the ml5 demo to word to vec okay so like what can you do, let's say, with rain, rain let's pick a word, um, you know, uh, microphone. So what microphone is similar to camera, ear, stereo, speaker. What do we mean by similar in this case, right? Because similar is kind of a vague word in terms of, um, in terms of word vectors, right? In this case, like, the, the reason why two words would have a very similar word vector is because they are... Um, uh, the reason why they would have very similar word is because um, they appear frequently interchangeably, right? So like you might think of he and she as opposites, right? But they would actually have very similar word vectors because they appear in context very close to each other. Uh, they, they appear f frequently in the same context. They're interchangeable, right? Um, so uh, w which is actually one of the reasons why it's difficult to, to figure out antonyms from, from word vectors. It doesn't actually work that well. Um, you can also do like, okay, between rainbow and kitten is cat, right? Um, yeah, I don't know why. <laughs> okay, between, let's, let's, pick a good, let's pick another one. How about... Uh, happy and sad. Happy and sad. Glad. <laughs> yeah. These are probably not the best word vectors because um, they have to fit in JavaScript, but yeah. Then, uh, okay, you can do analogies, right? So we, we have the whole, of course, like king is to uh, queen as man is to woman, right? Uh, let's try let's try another one. Like, uh, let's call some out. Something. Uh, kitten is the cat. I mean, adult child. Something. Adult is the child as, what, was it, what would it be? Uh, cat is to... Daughter. <laughs> These are really like not good word vectors. Uh, how about dog is to puppy? That one should have should have worked. Uh, <laughs> like, all right, let's see if dog is to puppy as cat. Come on. Oh come on. Yeah. Yeah. The uh, okay. So the problem. I think the actual vectors in the in the ML five like the that these are downloaded are probably just not that good. There are much better ones you could download. I think like the best ones are, are, well, this might be outdated by now, but Glove is really good. 
but I think they've been supplanted. Well, we'll see a few links later. Um, yeah. Just a, so the way these word vectors are trained is using either that skip, skip gram or... Yeah, I, I, don't, I don't actually know. You can read about it. It's probably... Okay. You can use the models we provide. So yeah, it's probably model, written in the GitHub. The model itself would be basically common English words as like a thousand point vectors or something. Oh, uh, how big would they be? It's oh. just the embeddings, it's not like a, a neural network. No, 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 it's just the embeddings, yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, there, there is some neural network but that it was trained for, but, but it's probably not part of this. Um, yeah, I don't know, I don't know actually uh, where the ML5 ones come from. We can ask Chris maybe, but um, in any case, like the, yeah, you, you'd probably be better off using like glove or something like that if you wanted to use word vectors. Uh, in any case, okay. Uh, oh, another thing is, okay, so then you have word vectors. Now, you also have sentence vectors too, or paragraph vectors or document vectors. Um, and uh, this is a little interesting because now you have what isn't, what is an unbounded essentially data point, right? You can have, uh, you can have entire uh, like documents be embedded into some language space, language vector space. And um, so how would this work, right? Well, okay, and this, this we're actually, we're not going to look at in too much detail. You, you, if you look up something like skip dot vectors or, or, um, or I'll mention universal sentence encoder, there is information on how these are trained, but it's a bit beyond their scope. So I won't talk about it. Actually, one way that you could do it that is in terms of stuff we've seen is you could use it like an LSTM. Right, because in LSTM, you can you can input a sequence of word vectors, and that conditions the LSTM, and then you can extract a feature vector from it. So that would be one way of doing it. It turns out there's better ways of doing it. So so that's actually not commonly used. Um, but um, but in any case, like the idea is that we can embed language into uh, like entire sentences into a space, and you can see that the relationships. You you also get these relationship vectors, right, between between uh, sentences, right? So the hardware store is in Queens. Where is the hardware store, right? That's the question inversion of that sentence. The mouse ate the cheese. What did the mouse eat? Again, question inversion. So maybe you might have like a question inversion vector that you can use, which could be useful for, say, a chatbot application, right? Something like that. Um, and then, yeah, Carla ate some bread. The mouse ate cheese. They're both about eating something. So they might be close to each other in space. Remember, it's not two dimensions. It's going to be like a thousand dimensional vector or, you know, or maybe even more. Um, I mentioned skip dot vector. So this is one way of training um, or this is one application of, of uh, sentence embeddings. And I've shown this slide already a few times. You've seen this, this whole joke where we describe like a picture. So it was trained on romance novels and then it takes an image and it, con and it conditions uh, it, it, um, you get a conditioning vector from the image using a convolutional network and then you tell a little story about it. Um, I've already shown this a few times so I don't, I don't want to belabor it. Um, the, I think the, the state of the art in sentence encoding is, uh, is probably this and this, this is from actually I think just earlier this year and we're going to take a look at it right now. Um, is this universal sentence encoder. So the, the idea, and okay, so it just takes in any, any block of text and it gives you an embedding, right? It gives you a vector. And the idea is that two sentences that are similar should have a similar embedding. And so what you see here is that this is a, this is a similarity matrix, right? So it shows what is the, how similar is the sentence, how old are you? To, you know, what is your age, right? So that would be like uh, this, right? How old are you and what is your age have a high amount of similarity, right? My phone is good and, and uh, what is your age, right, is, is a low similarity, right? So you can see that these should make sense. Of course, the diagonal is just how old are you to how old are you. So th these are all uh, just the same or perfect similarity. Uh, but the idea is that, that you can measure, you can actually evaluate how similar two sentences are. And, and of course, we do have to be very technical about what we mean by similar. You know, in this case, similar means that they have, um, you know, they, they have a, a similar context, similar subject, 
Um, they, they may not be similar among every dimension that, you, that you're that you interested in, uh, but basically, mostly it's about context and, and you know, topics. Um, probably topics is kind of the biggest thing that comes out. Um, then, uh, so yeah, and then you can use these for like, uh, you okay, so the idea of universal, why is this useful, right? So why is sentence uh, embedding useful? Uh, the point is that if you're dealing, if you're trying to do natural language processing tasks, then uh, using embeddings for sentences is great. Is a great start for transfer learning. So let's say the thing that you're actually interested in is detecting sentence, uh, detecting questions, detecting if something is a question. Um, you can train a neural network to go from the sentence embedding to the classification, which is sent uh, question or not question. And the sentence embeddings can actually just be your start. You can actually just download the universal sentence encoder and train it to do whatever task you're interested in. And it's a lot better than, than starting from scratch, um, especially if the sentences embeddings are good. I think this one is actually known to be quite good. Um, we can actually look, they have a Colab notebook over here. This link, I've already opened it up. So let's actually look at it really quickly. So you see just how easy it is to get started with this. You, we can run this in Colab. Um, I'm going to actually like, this is me just going through this notebook. Of course, this is online. And so we're gonna install all the stuff that we need. And then, and basically the actual encoder, which is a neural network that encodes any sentence is online here, right? So we're gonna grab this module URL. It's going to, and then it's going to load it into, right? And I, I, I just, if you look at the send, if you look at this, right? Basically it goes, okay, we want to compute a sentence encoding for every single message, right? And there's a few messages here. Like there's, we can just use a word. We can embed a, we can embed a single word. We can embed a sentence. So I am a sentence and I would like to get the embedding. We can embed a whole paragraph, right? Like a, you know, you can embed basically any amount any, uh, like you can embed any amount of text that you want, right? So then it's going to, this doing this through TensorFlow, it'll loop through the messages, right? So message embeddings is uh, basically, yeah. So it'll embed the messages. Embed is the actual, uh, is the sentence encoder right here. See how easy, it, I mean, well, okay. TensorFlow is hard to read, but it's like very little code. And you can see that basically, like if you can parse this, you basically have, here's your embeddings. It's just a bunch of vectors for each of these, for each of these elements. And then it just prints them out. So here's the message, here's how big it is, and here's the actual embedding. So you can look at it, it goes, okay, message elephant, the embedding size for all, of, okay, so universal sentence encoder gives a 512 dimensional uh, embedding. So, and just keep in mind, like when you have 512 dimensions, that means there's a lot of, directions you can go. So there's a ton of relationships, vector like uh, relationships that you can capture. Basically it's exponential with respect to the number of dimensions in the vector in the embedding. Um, and here's the embedding. Here they are. And so you can do, okay, so once you have that, you can do semantic textual similarity, right? So this is, this will produce that plot that we saw in the previous slide. So I'll just run this and then we can visualize it. Okay. So we have, here's our messages. I like my phone, my phone is not good, your cell phone looks great, we have some about the weather, we have some about food and health, an apple a day keeps the doctors away, right? So we'll take all of these, we'll embed them, and then it will, I think it should d display the visual, it'll take a, take a moment. Uh, oh, there it is, it's okay. I like my phone, my phone is not good, your cell phone looks great, will it snow? So obviously these three all deal with phones, so they all have self-similarity. Self <coughs> these clusters all deal with weather, so they have high similarity. We can, you know, we can try putting in our own sentences if we want, like how about, will it snow tomorrow? Let's change that to, how about this? Um, my phone got wet in the rain. Yeah, yeah, why not? Well, here, let, let's, let's put in something that's more funny for us. Like, uh, you know, NYU is the best school in the world. Yeah. Um, 
like my university is in outer space. Um, I hope I get into a good college. All right, so let's just try that. I don't know. Um, and you know, ideally, all of these deal with, of course, like uh, you know, school. So we, these should probably be self similar as well. Um, okay, so like you more or less get the idea. Yeah, there we go. It had the it had the effect that we imagine. Yeah, even though they all have different words, so school, college, and university are probably have very similar embeddings. Um, yeah, and then I think we can skip this. This is this is then just doing like evaluating the accuracy. So that's available to you here. Like you can you can uh, the, the the actual models are downloadable. So the universal sentence encoder is just a model that you can download online. So that's that's awesome, right? That's that's really useful. Um, and again, like if you know how to set up your own neural networks, you know we didn't really get to use Keras too deeply as in, uh, but like you could pretty quickly set up Keras and you know if you if you wanted to like look up you know Keras universal sentence encoder train you know you, there's gonna be a bunch of, yeah that you'll see there's tons of examples that show how to do tensor uh, that show how to do, uh, basically let you set up your own neural network. I'm sure it's down here somewhere like a yeah, okay It's like this will set up a neural network that will do You know, what is it that they're trying to train? I'm not actually sure what the task is they're trying to train, but let's say you're trying to train like um, You know sentiment detection, maybe you download a lot of tweets and you want to and you label a data set of like one or two thousand tweets um, as some category of interest, right? And you're interested in being able to identify them. So this would be pretty, pretty straightforward to set up in Keras. You know, it's a neural network that takes in the sentence embedding as its input, and then its output is, is a classification. Um, so, um, so yeah, you can you can understand why why this would be so useful. Yeah. Um, yeah, we, we mentioned skip dot vectors. Um, then, um, so, you know, sentence embeddings are also the uh, basis for, you know, we've already seen these, so I'm, I'm not going to talk about them again, but we've seen things like text to image and image to text. They, all, they usually deal with, uh, they, there is some sort of a sentence projection that happens to be part of the task, right? So, like, if you're trying to do text to image, then the input of that network is a sentence embedding. Uh, if you're trying to do image text, it's also it's a, the sentence embedding is the output, um, and and so obviously like there's a um, oh, well that's not exactly true well but but basically the that's the that's you can see that this is more or less the the wellspring of all these tasks, and as we as we saw this before, a woman is eating a delicious sandwich. This is going to be a sentence embedding that goes and produces some uh, generative model of you know a woman eating a sandwich. And we saw these projects, so I, I want to kind of skip them. Uh, this is kind of cool. Like you, I saw this just a few weeks ago. So now I'm uh, okay. Let's move out away a little bit from just sentence embeddings or, or, or language modeling and embedding, and talk about some cool things that you could do with natural language processing. Um, there's this notion of hierarchical story generation. This is just from a few weeks ago, and there is code and a data set for doing this. So I think there's, this is basically a uh, model that is trained to take a prompt and then write a story about it. And when I saw this, this was probably like the most coherent stories written by neural networks that I'd seen so far. Um, so that's, they're pretty impressive, right? So the, here's the prompt. The scientists have discovered something terrible. So the input is this, and then here's the output. The scientist stood there a little dazed as he stared. What is it, he asked, this... This, this thing, this is a virus, a chemical that can destroy entire planet and it is a very small, complex chemical that could destroy any planet. The scientist replied, his lab assistant looked down at the tablet. I've just discovered it, I can't believe it. It's like we're, we're, getting, we're getting pretty close to like making lang uh, like sentences and stories that sound plausibly written by humans, yeah? Uh, so, uh, well, um, I'm not sure. That's a good question. So let's let's look at it. 
it, it may very well be an LSTM. So basically, like, um, there's probably previous work has proposed de decomposing the challenge of generating long scenes text into a hierarchical gen generating task, for instance, using LSTM. Um, yeah, it's not using LSTM. Uh, or, no, no, no. Uh, not the hierarchical. Seek the seek. So it does use an LSTM for at least one of them. On cell below two. You can also do it with convolutional networks. You can do these auto regressive convolutional neural networks. That's how wave networks, because uh, it's also doing a sequence. Um, yeah, there's actually like, they, they probably have a whole ensemble of methods, but um, yeah, something to look into. In any case, um, it's pretty awesome, right? So, um, uh, the, the, I, I, this is um, this is pretty neat, and, and this was actually I just I just saw this the other day. So Cynthia Rudin is actually my uh, former advisor. Like she's my first advi like when I was uh, studying machine learning, and I just learned that she submitted this to NIPS with her. Um, she's at uh, in uh, at Duke, and they made this really cool. Like uh, one of her students made this really neat poetry generating thing. So it writes sonnets. All right. So. Code for shall I compare thee to a machine written sonnet? So you can you can totally download this code. It um, and it and it basically generates poems. The uh, they they kind of added. Uh, th this isn't using. I don't think this is using um, any sort of like sentence embeddings. But it basically uh, is. I haven't looked at this closely, so I don't know exactly what it's doing. But it, it does generate like pretty plausible poems. The man whose name I do not know. The earth and of a woman to lament. I see that you are in the eastern game. To me the odor of his hat and scent, and if it shall be dear to me his name. And now I say it is without surprise, it is the odor of his neck and eyes. So not bad, right? And it has, and it has like, it's actually it has pentameter, and also, or, or uh, like, like it, it has some sort of a, a, a rhythm, and it imposes uh, rhyme as well. Um, so they have all sorts of constraints that they can actually combine with language modeling in order to make plausible poetry. So that's, that's pretty cool. Um, yeah. Um, this is pretty cool. I'm just showing you some like random things. This is a little thing that they did at Stanford where they basically try to track the change of different, the meanings of different words over time by doing, by doing word embeddings in uh, like like across multiple eras, right? And comparing the drift of a word, right? So like like gay is an obvious one, right? The meaning of that has changed over time. I didn't know about awful though. So I like and, and, it, and it, so apparently you know in the 1800s, awful meant something like like actually amazing, like <laughs> like it meant awesome, right? Because awful, it's full of <clears throat> awe, right? But now it means something terrible, and so that's pretty interesting. You can track the drift of words in their meaning over time. And I, and I think this is really cool because one thing is like, if you're interested in like linguistics, like I am, like I'm really interested in how languages compare. And you know that like words shift in meaning and then the, the word, you know, you get false friends, like the meanings in two languages, which are very close to each other, the meanings of two words that sound the same, it can actually be very different, right? So like in German, the word um, gift means poison, right? So. Uh, but but it has the same etymology actually as as the English word gift, so this is kind of like can track the process of language drift over time, and yeah, so like people are very innovative with language, and so you kind of can actually see how how words evolve over time. Um, language translation is probably the most like maybe arguably the most like um, it's the self-driving cars of natural language processing, right? It's like the thing that everyone's most excited about, automatic language translation. Um, so, and, and you know, there's multiple ways of doing, uh, and this is kind of worth, worth talking about because it's very interesting. Um, so the, the way that, the most straightforward way to do sentence, um, to do language translation is to frame it as a sequence to sequence problem, you know, maybe a sequence of word vectors and use an LSTM or some recurrent neural network to input a sequence of words and then output a sequence of words. And that's how language um, translation has generally worked. Or, or actually, okay, there's three eras, let's say. 
That's how deep language translation has worked for the last few years. Before that, the way language translation worked was it was full of all sorts of handwritten uh, like expert rules where uh, using techniques from computational linguistics, you would, you would uh, create a language like a, like a part of speech tree to figure out what the subject and the predicate is. And then you would use like the rules of the language to invert the subject and the predicate and then you know, do all of this sort of hand-coded rules. And then they were like, okay, like, let's not do that. Now what we'll do instead is we'll train LSTMs to go from a sequence of words to a sequence of, of words. And that, that's, that's much more elegant, right, than using all of this manual, uh, manual expert rules. Uh, but it has a weakness, which is that you need parallel text. So you need, you need actually like translations of things to train on, right? So, um, which, you know, there's plenty of that available, for, but, but if you think about it, for like a lot of languages that are spoken by like 500 people in the world, it's pretty hard to find enough data to do language translation. And so one of the things that uh, Facebook, actually Facebook AI kind of pioneered this this year, or maybe last year, is um, doing a completely different approach to, to, um, to language translation, which does not require parallel text. All, what they do is they take a number of languages, they do this for multiple languages at the same time. They'll take a big corpus of text from, for one language, a big corpus of text for another language, like all completely not parallel. And they, they embed all of them into like word vector space. And then you can do this trick where you see like, okay, if, if, if this is two different languages and they have, okay, this is English and, and I guess this is Spanish, right? You know, they, they're, they're separate embeddings, right? You know, here's the embedding for English, here's the embedding for, for Spanish. And, but they should have the same relationships like in, inherent intrinsically between them, right? And so the idea is that you can actually try to rotate them into the same sort of uh, manifold, right? And you can, by doing this, you can actually create connections between the, the words in each space and be able to translate them that way. Um, and if you, you can do this with many languages at the same time, and what, what you get as a result of that is that you get this sort of manifold that represents that where you have a like word embeddings that are irrespective of any language and you're projecting all of the individual languages into that manifold right um, yeah so um, even I mean the only way for me to understand this is uh, is when you're say aligning two different images because that's a two-dimensional vector space versus mm -hmm. um, thousands of dimensions yeah, yeah. Um, mm -hmm. and, but even when you're working with two dimensions that alignment uh, uh, sort of function can be complicated you have to yeah, yeah. be like oh am I going to align these two points or these two points right, right. am I going to get both these two points sort of as so that they're as close as possible yeah, yeah. and so I'm, I'm imagining that this must also be incredibly yeah yeah it's difficult active. it is right but that that's actually just the case like when you have multiple dimensions when you have more dimensions you have more degrees of freedom um, so it's actually like being in two dimensions or three dimensions is actually very constraining because you can't do the rotation perfectly ever. There's not enough, there's not enough degrees of freedom. Um, but here, like there's more degrees of freedom. Yeah, are there <laughs> ways that you can do this that where you prioritize certain types of, I don't know, meaning or types of, to say like, oh, this, it, you know, it, when we train it this way, it, it, it feels the topics of politics and um, and sure. history very accurately, but then other things get kind of weird. Or... Sure, sure, yeah. I mean, there, you know, uh, in principle, there certainly are. I mean, I, I can't necessarily, off the top of my head, list particular ones. But you, but um, in in any sort of task that you're training, like in, like here, they're training embeddings, right? And you can always impose additional constraints into the loss function that you're training, like depending on what those might be. So, um, I mean, you know, regularization is, is what one type of, there might be more specific ones that are like kind of relevant to what you're doing. Um, but yeah, I w that's probably like a, a relatively out of scope question for us, but it's, it's definitely like something that you could, that you could look up if you find. Um, when uh, Facebook did this, there was a whole flurry of stories that were basically something like this. They were, they were all varieties of like Facebook's AI invents its own languages and they have to shut down the, the computers 
is something like this. That I don't know if I, if anyone saw these articles when they came out. Okay, this was actually over a year ago now, so this has been a while. They've been iterating on this, but um, I, this was probably like a single best example of like just the like gulf of understanding between like researchers and and um, and you know like the press because there were all these articles that were basically like just absolutely obscene. You know, like AI is inventing languages humans can't understand. Should we stop it? You know, it's like. And this is like, and researchers like, no, 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 it's just a, it's just a, you know, a manifold that has embeddings on it. It's like actually like really technical and it's not what you're saying it is. But, but you know, this is sort of the age that we live in, right? Okay, um, I want to, let's just see how we're doing on time. It's 106. Uh, I want to show you two practical things that you can do. And uh, then we'll we'll take a break. And I'm gonna go through these kind of quickly. I already have them prepared, so so we're gonna I'm gonna show you how you can do these. So the first thing that you can do um, this and this is the link uh, for the individual repo. But actually, uh, I just uh, also merged this into ML4A guides. So this is one of the notebooks now inside of ML4A guides. I don't have that much documentation on it. I still have to improve that a little bit, but it, but it's there. I'm gonna show you what this does. So this is gonna make let us do a TSNI of documents, right? So be able to see that like, okay, here's a bunch of conservatism articles. Here's a, a bunch of nationalism articles, right? It'd be cool if you're able to take blocks, you know, different, let's say emails or, or uh, books, right? It'd be cool to be able to embed books in uh, a feature space. That would be a great project, by the way, embedding books in a feature space, like, um, Maybe scraping books from uh, what is it, the Gutenberg Archive or something like that? That has a lot of books in the public domain. And chapters in the books. Sorry. Even chapters. Even chapters. Yeah. 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 Totally. In any case, I'll show you how you can do this. And and I should I should mention right off the bat that I'm using a somewhat older technique for doing this. I should really update it to use um, some of these more deep learning techniques. But this is actually using. A very very old um, I mean not very old but like uh, somewhat more classical technique in natural language processing called latent semantic analysis which is quite easy to understand I would compare latent semantic analysis it's basically the same as it's like principal component analysis for ta text right uh, latent semantic analysis There's also something called latent Dur Dirichlet allocation which is like a very closely related um, technique for embedding text into a feature space. I'm gonna show you how to use this and then I'm also going to show you um, a couple of other uh, NLP tasks that you can do with Spacey. So WikiTSNI basically is, and you can read through this, what it, what it will do is I'm using a, um, so I'm gonna show you, I'm gonna actually take you through this. We're not gonna do the whole analysis, I already have it saved, uh, but basically, there's a, there's a Python library called Wikipedia, which you can download, that lets you just download uh, articles of text from Wikipedia. It's really easy, right? So like you can do Wikipedia, like if you do this text, um, Wikipedia page, like find some article. So like, okay, what's, what's an article? Um, New York University, right? So if we run this and then print the text, it's going to give us the text for the Wikipedia page on New York University. Oh, and then, well, okay, it just gives us an object and then it's text.content. <laughs> New York University is a private research university, blah, blah, blah. So you, can, so you can really easily extract Wikipedia articles. And it also has um, the ability to extract links. So here what I do is I start with this page, vital articles in Wikipedia, right? So you can look this up, Wikipedia vital articles. This is basically like Wikipedia's most important articles. And so what you can do is you can actually extract all the links from here. It's just a ton of like, you know, vital articles. Okay, history of different, you know, countries, uh, musicians and composers, science articles, like all of this kind of stuff. And, uh, oops. and so what this will do is it will actually go through all of the articles in the links. So here's main page links. It'll grab the articles, in all, grab all those links and then grab the text from them. And then this takes a little while. You can see that like I downloaded 1,000 articles 
and I save them. I put them in, in here. So I already saved them and I have them loaded. So this shows you how to, you know, you can change this if you want or you can use your own parser. You don't have to use Wikipedia. Uh, so this will save the articles. And then this will calculate what's called a, um, okay, well actually it's using SVD. So this is a way of doing what's called latent semantic analysis. What it will do is it will, it will calculate a TF-IDF matrix. TF-IDF stands for uh, Term Frequency Inverse Document Frequency. It's basically a gigantic matrix where all of the rows are the documents, all of the columns are all of the unique words that appear in any document. And then the element is how important that word is to that article. And that the metric that's used is something called TFIDF, where it's proportional to the number of to the frequency of that word. Um, yeah, so it's the proportion. Well, okay, you can you can read this, but basically, it's proportional to the frequency of the word appearing in that article, and inversely proportional to how frequently it occurs in other articles. The point is that the number is bigger if that article is unique to that article. Uh, if the if the word is unique to that article, and it's lower if it's you know the. It's going to have to be the lowest. And then what it does is it basically does this truncated SVD is almost the same thing as PCA, so principal component analysis. So it'll take that huge TF-IDF matrix and then do a dimensionality reduction on it. And this is a way of modeling topics. What it does is it basically condenses words into topics. Um, and so similar words basically get projected into, the, into topics uh, together. And then, so you have a feature vector for each for each document. So, like I said, this is kind of an old school way of doing this, um, but but it does work pretty decently. Uh, it would it would definitely be better to to do something like um, you know sentence encoding or, um, well, well I, I don't know. I guess I don't know how well the sentence encoders work for like gigantic books. There might be a there might be a slight, somewhat better way of, of doing it. But in any case, like then um, I'll calculate a TSNI on those feature vectors associated with all the articles. There's a thousand of them. So it computes the TSNI. I'm not going to do it now. I've already done it. So this is just shows you. If you go through cell by cell, you can recreate this like like easily. Um, then what I'm actually doing is I um, using raster ferry, we showed this when we did TSNI. You can take the TSNI projections and put it into a grid. And that's kind of nice because text is like, when the text is on top of each other, you can't read it. So I, I gave it a grid assignment. And then this is just writing out HTML. So it just put, puts, puts it into HTML and saves it to a file called index.html. In the original version of this, I had, I had it use p5.js and using the DOM library, that would also be a nice uh, welcome addition. I just did, I didn't add it to this one because I was a little lazy and I just wrote out the bare HTML. But this, this, is, um, uh, this would work like very easily with p5 as well. And then basically it looks like this. So let's let's open it. I'm going to download it from here, and um, we can open it in Safari. And it shows all of the vital articles, and they've been uh, they've been uh, yeah they've been they've been um, grouped according to like similarity, right? So okay, truth, reason, metaphysics, Aristotle, existence, right? So there's like a philosophy cluster here. You know, if you go down here, we see theater. Oh, <laughs> that's strange. Okay, some religious stuff: Quran, prayer, Jesus. Um, uh, Al Quartzimi was actually um, who the, the guy who invented algebra. <laughs> so I mean, some of them. Um, oh, you know what? Maybe it's grouping like basically Arabic names close to each other because there'll be a lot of because maybe those are like th th this is kind of the limitation of this. Like sometimes it doesn't get topics very well. It might just like get group articles together because there's a lot of Arabic words in them or something like that. And they, there aren't a lot in the other in the other articles. So it's about a limitation. Here's some history stuff, history of the Middle East, post-classical history, Cold War. Cold War, Soviet Union, Joseph Stalin, dictatorship, um, you know, Philippines, China, Argentina. So there's a bunch of, um, there's a bunch of countries here. So you get the idea. So it's pretty cool. Like you can, and you can do this with any grouping of text that you want. Obviously, like this is just a thousand of them, but but this would be um, like really nice to do, uh, like in a different way. I, I saw a while ago there was a really neat thing. I can't. I, I don't remember. Like 
It was something like like a map of philosophy or something. Has anyone seen this? It's like a Oh, it's I think it's this, yeah. Graphing the history of philosophy. So it would be cool to do to recreate something like this based on these techniques. And I don't know if like yeah. I think there's some Descartes. You, there's some interactive browser for this, right? So it's yeah, pretty cool stuff. Right? Uh, there's one more thing I want to show you before the break, which is the uh, spacey examples. So here's uh, so basically there's uh, here's a few uh, Python-based natural language processing libraries that you can use. NLTK and Scikit-Learn are kind of the classic ones. GenSim is more recent, and, and Spacey is actually the most recent. Spacey is really awesome. It's like a super modern um, library that's being developed by this by this company in Berlin called Explosion AI. So funny, funny name. Um, and it, and it's it's really it's really useful, and convenient. It has a lot of like pre-built built-in data sets and word vectors. Um, it's it's a lot less clunky than NLTK, although it kind of uses NLTK as one of its um, one of its dependent libraries. I'll show you some of the stuff that it can do. So here's, I put this into ML for a guides. This is just shows you, there's no documentation yet. It's like super new, but um, I'll put more soon. Um, anyway, in any case, pip install spacey, we'll install it, super easy. Um, and then you download the English language module or whatever language you want to, you want to use. And then it also uses NLTK. You can download the, the stuff that it needs for here. And okay, so this will do like, um, this will do set this does sentiment analysis so along four axes so if you run this like the sentence i am so happy that finally all of us are together again negative zero neutral it's mostly neutral okay that's not great like <laughs> should be more happy it has a positive is, is a little high um i'm the happiest person in the whole happy world let's get more Okay, positive is yanking up a little bit. Um, let's do something more negative, like I hate, you know, my enemies. <laughs> okay, um, negative, very negative, right? So it has negative, neutral, positive. I'm not sure what compound is supposed to mean, actually. Uh, you'd have to look that up in the documentation, but okay. So polarity scores, those are the polarity scores. I think that has different metrics as well. So that's really awesome. You have this built-in sentiment al analyzer, right? You don't even have to train one yourself. You just have it built in uh, to the to the um, to Spacey. Here's another thing you could do. Okay, it does um, basically entity recognition. So okay, like I just bought two shares at 9 a.m. because the stock went up 30% in just two days, according to the WSJ. So then it prints out, okay, cardinal direct, uh, cardinal, oh, that number, okay. Time, 9 a.m., percent, 30%, date, just two days, org, organization, Wall Street Journal, I guess. Um, you know, if, you do, if we wanna do like, um, we are at New York University studying machine learning at 12 p.m. Um, and uh, I don't know, um, well, let's just try that. Okay. Look how fast it is, right? New York university organization time, 12 PM. So it's, it's, um, and it, it even gets New York university rather than New York. Right. So it actually does a really good job because this is much more difficult than it looks this ambiguating, you know, different kinds of, um, like word relationships. Uh, this one, yeah, next week I'll be in Madrid. Oh, this does a uh, part of speech recognition. So anyone a linguist here that you can recognize, like, okay, and then is something noun, what is it? Neutral noun or something? There's like, <laughs> I used to remember, I used to know these, but okay. These are all part of speech tags, basically. Um, so you can do, uh, you, it, it also lets you do lexical trees, uh, like a lot of really useful stuff, right? Um, okay, like, yeah, I put this one sentences. So you can do uh, sentence similarity here. Okay, so you, this is basically the same thing as a sentence encoder. And I, I don't know, it may or may not be as good but as the others, but let's, let's try like, um, yeah, I don't know, like, I uh, love machine learning. 
and computer science makes me happy. <laughs> and let, let's compare it three. Uh, let's compare actually, uh, like doc three and four. Let's see how similar these two are. Oh, computer science makes me happy. Okay, not bad. 0.54. So the most similar are the first two. Cats are beautiful animals. Dogs are awesome. Some gorgeous creatures are felines. Cats are beautiful animals. So those are the most similar. And then these are actually pretty similar. Um, the least similar is target. So cats are beautiful animals and computer science makes me happy. Those are the least similar sentences here. Um, and then this is one, I pulled this out of one of the examples. I think it does like uh, sentiment analysis and pulls out emo emojis, like grabs hashtags and, and uh, emojis and stuff. So, so a bunch of pretty cool stuff. And, and actually, if you go to these links, this is all in ML for a guides. If you go to these links, there's more examples there of things that you can do with Spacey. It's really, really easy to use. Like, like if you, if you can, if you can get your way around Python, you'll find that this library is like pretty straightforward. Um, okay, so that's all the natural language processing stuff. Uh, does anyone have any questions on this stuff before we completely switch gears into something completely different? No? Okay, then uh, let's take a quick break and um, we'll come back and we'll talk about games. Yeah. Now we're going to switch gears. We're going to talk about a completely different topic that doesn't actually overlap all that much with NLP, but uh, is no less interesting. And that is the topic of reinforcement learning. So reinforcement learning, I, I introduced briefly in the first week, and it's, it's more or less the, I would say, the pinnacle of AI. It, in fact, it is what AI used to mean, where it's concerned with creating, um, you know, agents that interact with worlds, with environments, right? And we're going to talk a lot about video games because video games happen to be kind of the, the best way of approaching the topic, or at least the least expensive way. Um, and uh, we're going to talk about, a lot about classic video games like these. Um, these are all coming from OpenAI Gym, which I'll mention a little later. And, um, and so yeah, well, let's kind of get into it. First of all, what is reinforcement learning? Uh, before getting into what reinforcement learning is, let's talk a little bit about what the problems or limitations of supervised and unsupervised learning is. And recall from previous, definite, previous classes, supervised and unsupervised learning is more or less the kind of machine learning we've done so far. It involves creating models that understand data sets and, and kind of perceive them, you know, extract knowledge from them, right? And uh, within that paradigm, let's call it, we haven't had any notion of some sort of an external environment in which the model is operating inside. And there's no interaction between the model and the environment, right? And um, you know, we're in, in, in most cases in the real world, we're really concerned with creating uh, agents that actually operate within the environment, operate within the world, have an effect on the real world and vice versa, and, and basically interact with it, right? And so this is kind of like really putting machine learning into the real world. That, that's kind of the pursuit. And it's most closely associated with the pursuit of artificial general intelligence, intelligence, which is the idea of trying to create truly AIs, right? AIs that can not only do a specific task they were trained for, but they are capable of high level reasoning and other cognitive skills, right? Reasoning, planning, um, and so forth. So the reinforcement learning problem is to basically create agents that inter that take actions within the world and in order to pursue some uh, to, to basically maximize some some goal some pursuit okay so supervised learning we learned supervised learning is kind it kind of fits this paradigm right you have a data set which produces a data a, a sample x feeds a model and out comes a, an output Y, right? A, um, and then that's more or less like the most high level view of supervised learning that we can take, right? And we can kind of adapt this in, and think about it in the following way. The, 
you have instead of a data set you have some environment which is producing observations right or a state about the world Whoa, what's going on here Hang on. hold on a second i think the projector is it all right okay cool so yeah um the uh so yeah we can we can kind of replace the view of the data set with within a notion of an environment which produces observations that we call a state you know and the state kind of tells us what's going on right now and then uh, instead of just the model you have an agent and the agent may have a model you know within it a model of the world and it extracts out knowledge right so we've kind of adapted it so that's supervised learning now we're going to complicate it in the following way now there's interaction between the environment and the agent so it's not just that there's not just a one-way relationship where the agent takes in some uh, some observation from the environment and then tries to do something with it. It actually then also undertakes actions which affect the environment in turn. And so you have a dynamical system now, right? And a dynamical system is a is um, a, no, a concept in mathematics that suggests that you know a system which is which is capable of unpredictable behavior basically, um, and which is subject to the initial conditions that the system is being simulated in, right? So th this is the this is the the basic reinforcement learning scenario. You have an agent and environment. The agent takes actions which affect the environment. The environment produces a state that it sends the agent. It, it is basically a, a data point. It tells the agent what's going on. And also, and this is crucial, the agent is trying to maximize some goal, and it uh, and we the, the way we normally uh, construe this is it's like a reward signal. There's some sort of a reward that the agent is pursuing, dopamine basically, um, for the agent, and uh, that will that will of course vary a lot. In, it's very general. It will vary a lot in the context, uh, but basically all the reinforcement learning scenarios fit under this kind of uh, framework. So again, like agent takes actions and uh, receives a reward signal in a state. So um, let's talk about some examples of reinforcement learning problems, right? Um, a lot of robotics is very much reinforcement learning driven because uh, robots, of course, operate inside of the real world. They do things like ride bicycles and play ping pong. Um, they clean people's houses. They, you know, walk around like dogs and so on. Um, because and you know there's there's really no other way to do robotics because you know robots actually have tangible effects on the on the real world right um, and uh, then of course there's also you know playing games and and you know you can think of games in a frivolous sort of way you know video games and board games but games can also be thought of in a more gen general sense right games are you know multiplayer strategy uh, sort of well, games, right? I mean, um, you can think of a lot of things in, in, in the sense of game theory. And then uh, think, even things like investing in the stock market, which can kind of be construed mostly as a supervised learning scenario. Nevertheless, like uh, investing in the stock market does have an effect on it. And so this is often also framed as some sort of an agent that's trying to, um, you know, optimize some reward signal that, that it has an effect on. And then things like transportation logistics and you know a lot of in industry and com commerce is uh, very much in the framework of of, um, of reinforcement learning. What are some challenges in reinforcement learning? As you look at this like little uh, stick figure trying to learn how to walk without much success, it's pretty fun. <laughs> That's the sort of stuff that you might see like in the early stages of training reinforcement learning agents trying to walk. Um, so there's a few challenges. One is that instead of having a supervisor, you know, some supervision, which is what you have in supervised learning, you have a reward signal. And the reward signal is, um, you know, so point one and point three are kind of, are kind of related here. The, the reward signal does not correspond to like each individual observation, right? It's kind of this like, um, potentially very far delayed signal, right? You have, a, you have some sort of a feedback that you're receiving, but it's, it's unclear whether the feedback refers to the observation that you have right before you, or if it's, or if it's um, really as a result of actions that you took you know, a while ago. 
Um, this is called the credit assignment problem, right? You have this, let, let, let's say the reward is trying to win the game. Well, you might win the game a lot later than the actions that you undertook that actually led you to winning it. And so this is a huge problem. Like it, we don't have this problem in supervised learning where there's always a very tight relationship between X and Y. Now we have to actually try to figure out what rewards corresponded to what actions. And that's a, that's a very difficult problem. It's a dynamical system, as I mentioned. Early decisions affect the game very far into the future, indefinitely far. And so um, interaction is, is, um, is very much like, can be hard to predict. Um, you can often find yourself in un, un, unknown new states. And then, um, and then this is kind of an artificial one, this sort of lack of high level information. Because reinforcement learning is very closely tied to the pursuit of AGI, one of the artificial constraints we often deal with, in, uh, I say artificial in the sense that it's, it's unnecessary if you're, uh, unless you're trying to optimize for AGI, basically. The, the idea is that we want to make these systems have as little, as few domain-specific rules and expertise as possible. Um, so, so if we're trying to win a game, we may not even program the rules of the game. And the reason is because we want this, we want the thing that we're creating to be able to generalize to other systems that have different rules. And so often we are actually stripping away all of the meaningful information that might otherwise make the reinforcement learning agent um, effective. Um, so so that, that's kind of like some of the challenges that, that we deal with in RL. Okay, so let's look at one example of an RL game. Uh, which is which is playing video games, right? So one of the big first um, one of the first times that reinforcement learning, especially deep reinforcement learning, kind of got some press attention was um, when DeepMind, which we're hearing about quite a lot these days, aren't we? Um, they created uh, a reinforcement learning system which was able to <coughs> learn how to play Atari games. Now, um, everyone's seen Atari games. You know, it's a little bit before most, most people's times here, I guess. But, um, but it, it, may, it may seem kind of silly at first. Like, why would, like, what, uh, first of all, why is it so difficult to play Atari games? Like, we have AIs that play Atari games, right? We have AIs that play Pong and Breakout. And, you know, they have simple rules and they actually work pretty effectively. But the reason what made this very special is that they um, used reinforcement learning with very few almost zero knowledge of the games pre-programmed into it. So they really, really uh, constrained it to work under the most difficult circumstances. And in so doing, they were able to devise a single algorithm which was able to play multiple Atari games and beat them all. Um, so that's, that's actually quite interesting. Um, and the limitations that are pre-programmed into it are actually really severe. And we'll see that actually in, in the next few slides. Um, or actually, I guess I should mention it in this slide. Yeah, let, let me mention it in this slide. So, so basically, the idea is, this is what they, this is how they perceive it. So the Atari is the world, right? That's your in, environment, and the agent is basically, you know, you're the agent. You have control over that little green thing that shoots, you know, shoots things at the baddies, right? And it, you, and and the and the agent has control over a joystick, so it has a rel relatively limited action space. But um, but it it does you know affect the environment right, and the Atari uh, projects a an observation of the current state which is you know the the game to the agent, and the reward signal which is the score, right, and the goal is to optimize the score. Now the state is all all it is is just pixels. It is literally raw pixels. Now you might think that it would be better for it to send information like the position of the agent the position of all of the baddies um, and all of this sort of information. But um, they do not do that because they don't want to, they're, they're not trying to optimize an algorithm to play, um, what is this game called? I forgot. Uh, Space, Space Invaders. Yeah. They're not trying to optimize a game to beat Space Invaders. They're trying to optimize a game that will basically learn from simply a reward signal and an observation. So all they do is feed it screen pixels, raw screen pixels. It doesn't, you don't know anything about what you're controlling or what the entities in it are, just pixels. Uh, you have a question? Yes, uh, but the reward is processed before it gets to the agent. What do, you, what do you mean? The, the agent knows what the score is. Yes, the agent knows what the score is. 
Right, yeah, 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 right. It, it is actually given a, a signal, like a reward signal. Yeah. Did they um, have the, the agent perform like in physical space? Like with a camera looking at a, at a like a cathode ray tube television? And a, and no, a I, they're, they're, you know, they're projecting the game pixels, yeah. yeah. I mean, you could do it that way if you wanted to, but, but I don't think they went that route, yeah. Uh, I mean, you know, something like a robot is going to be using a camera, right? But but here you actually just have a TV, whatever. Yeah. Um, so uh, so yeah, that that's the idea. You just get screen pixels, and you're given the joystick and a reward signal. And the goal is to optimize the reward given the screen pixels. It doesn't know anything about the rules of the game. So at first, it's just going to basically randomly move around, right? It's just going to move this this joystick basically randomly, right? But the idea is that as it makes actions and carries them out, sometimes it might reward in a higher score than other times, and sometimes it will reward in a lower score. And so it very slowly begins to figure out what actions it needs to take in order to, uh, in order to actually increase the reward. So um, the way that this is basically con uh, construed is, a, is w using what's called deep Q learning. And, we're, and we, this is the kind of thing I would have expanded on if we had a whole class, but I don't, I'm just going to mention it very briefly. The idea of deep key learning, it comes from something called Q learning. And Q learning is sort of the classical approach to reinforcement learning and, and deals with this notion of, of uh, how to, you know, basically combine a possibly delayed reward signal with a, with a state and action space. And the idea of Q learning is that you're trying to learn a policy, what's called a policy. And the policy is a function which takes in an observation of the state and uh, the reward and then basically uh, specifies some action. So it's kind of like, like um, you know, a, 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 you know you, if you, let's say you're playing something like uh, playing a maze, right? You're, you're trying to solve the maze. Then the Q function would tell you if you're in a particular cell in the maze at any time, where do you go next, right? And then deep Q learning is the application of deep learning to um, the two uh, uh, creating a, a Q learning policy, a Q, a Q function policy. Now, um, again, like in just very briefly, the, w the, the way that uh, like, okay, so what, what you have basically essentially is a neural network, a deep neural network that takes in the screen pixels and then the output is the joystick. So it's just mapping pixels to joystick. That's, that's, the, out that's the thing that it's trying to output. And the function, the loss function that is trying to optimize, is basically the re is a is the reward. Now uh, remember that the reward is not necessarily associated with each action. So the way it actually works is that it, it takes the reward signal and then sums it over many time steps, applying some discount to future reward signal because you care more about the reward now. But 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 of course like future rewards or you're possibly trying to optimize as well. That gives it some understanding of time um, as well. And then it's unrolled over many, many time steps and more or less fit into a deep learning like scenario. So this is what's called deep Q learning. You can read all about it in this paper where they describe it for the Atari, Atari games. Um, there's probably um, like a few canonical uh, resources, that, uh, a few canonical papers that it links to. So you can get a much more specific um, a, a much more rigorous understanding of this. If you read, if you go, I would start there basically. Um, but that is that is more or less the notion of deep Q learning and deep reinforcement learning. Basically, um, that's what we mean by it. Okay, so like given that we receive some screen pixels and an input and score, like let's try to see what it looks like trying to to win, right? So, um, okay, pong, right? So there's been no training. And basically, yeah, it's pretty, it's, you know, the, <laughs> just the paddle just has no idea, right? It's just kind of moving around, like basically randomly. After an hour of training, it begins to kind of like move around and it's not so good. It's losing eight to one, but it's kind of like figuring out like, oh, there's this like little ball that I'm trying to chase around. And every time I get near it, something good, uh, sometimes something good happens, right? Okay, 500,000 frames of training. Now it's starting to be competitive with the with the with the ai right that's that's an ai that actually knows the rules of the game and then yeah within uh let's see like okay after 10 hours it's unbeatable basically <laughs> yeah. yeah it's like a goalie 
right? So okay, now it's now it's um, yeah, now it's winning pretty handily. It is pretty impressive. Now okay, Pong is definitely not the world's most complex game, but remember, it doesn't know what a paddle is. It doesn't know what it's doing really. Like it doesn't have the rules explicitly encoded. All it knows is screen pixels and score, and uh, and it and it's trying to optimize the score. And so it learns a policy that that basically optimizes the score pretty well. Yeah. So okay, so that's Atari. There's here's some other examples: Breakout, uh, Sequest, and Space Invaders. What's really cool about this, and you can read about this in the paper, is that the uh, it learns all sorts of like high level strategies that humans learn. So look look on the right. Uh, that's that's Breakout, right? So if, if you ever played this game, right, you you learn pretty quickly as a human that like the thing that you want to do, right, is build a tunnel into the into right. So right now it's playing like a human. It's doing pretty well. But after some training, it figures out that it needs to, yeah, it realizes that digging a tunnel through the wall is the most effective technique to beat the game. So it actually learns this strategy where it builds a tunnel on the side and then it gets all of, it gets all of it, right? Is that what it's doing? Yeah, there it is, right? Is there a time component for its reward as well? Like, oh, like get the highest score in the smallest amount of time? Or? Uh, yes, uh, th that's kind of, a, that's be there is a discount signal to the reward. So, so the discount, the discount rate, uh, which is a term from economics, in fact, is basically what controls like how important the present is to the future. Yeah. And we'll, we'll see a few variations on this actually later uh, in this, in the, in the lecture, we'll talk, we'll see like uh, ways that this can be expanded in interesting ways. Uh, some stuff about multi-agent cooperation. Check this out, they're, they're playing sumo, or sumo wrestling. Right? So if you're interested in like multi-agent games, you, this is a good place to look. They both get pretty good eventually. So, you know, having a low center of gravity, they figure out that that's very useful. What's cool is that like, okay, it's, it, it basically relearns human strategy. Like, okay, if you're sumo wrestling, you want to have a low center of gravity, I assume. Um, I didn't, it's not like I learned that in my sumo wrestling career, um, or did I? <laughs> no. Anyway, like, um, and, and so the, these agents kind of learn like, okay, you, well, I mean, they look pretty silly, but, but I don't think they were programmed to like, you know, c c you know, crouch, right? Um, so here's some reinforcement learning in the real world, cart pole balancing. So this is kind of like one of the first things, um, oh, let's, yeah. What, what, like okay, one of the first like examples that you learn is trying is trying to teach a a like a, a cart to balance a uh, to balance a pole, right? It's one of the simplest um, scenarios that can be done with reinforcement learning, right? Because basically, what is your what is your joystick in this case? It's basically the velocity that you can apply to that motor, and then the reward signal is 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 whether the pole is standing basically like the angle of the pole and then it's receiving that reward signal and it's receiving the observation about where the where the pole is hanging right so we're we're basically fitting the exact same framework we saw a few slides ago to a context that looks completely different right okay so after some amount of time after 25 trials okay still not doing so well it's kind of like jostling around Okay, it's still not very good. We gotta fast forward a little bit. <laughs> okay, 29 trials. It's starting to swing it a little bit, but okay, at some point it's gonna... Okay, now it's like starting to swing the pole. Okay, a little bit too much, right? Oh, almost, right? Okay, 180 trials. Look at that. Yeah. And eventually it's like really, really good, right? And then it's, then it resists. It's even resists. <laughs> right? So yeah, very closely related to this. Actually here, let's look, let's look at this. This is also like in the world of robotics, uh, there's a lot of like, uh, um, people trying to train robots to like grip things, right? So like, okay, try to pick up this, this, whatever it is, like a piece. 
this light. <laughs> it's like got a little gripper. Or actually, I don't know what the goal is. It's trying to turn it around. I don't know. Oh, oh, right, 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 right. It's trying to trying to put it where the little red dot is. Right. So put it somewhere. Put something somewhere. Like it has eyes. <laughs> um, the gr gripping is surprise. Like turns out that like getting these bots to grip things is surprisingly hard. Like we take for granted how like dex you know dexterous our hands are. But it's really hard to get robots to like grip things without breaking them, basically. Um, so there's all sorts of like interesting work in in robotics, um, getting them to to do cool things like that. Okay, um, this is cool. So this is something called Deep Mimic that you can find here, and it basically tries to get like um, these bots to more or less like learn how to carry out actions, simulate actions that that they get from real footage, right? More or less trying to mimic humans, uh, human actions, right? So kick the ball, walk, you know. Is this done on pixels? Sorry. It's done with looking at. No, this is this is actually like a like a like a three D model. Yeah, uh, here they don't actually constrain it to, to pixels, but. Okay, so now we're getting to my favorite part of the reinforcement learning lecture. We're gonna start to talk about. Um, we're gonna start to talk about like. Um, games and stuff and uh, and Monte Carlo tree search and and go and chess and all this kind of stuff so uh, uh, and and well yeah like I well okay so let, let, let's just start with Monte Carlo tree search right so in in a lot of reinforcement learning scenarios w in which we're playing games the um, the idea is that you have to plan very far ahead sometimes right and uh, that can be quite challenging to do when the search base is very big so in a lot of like pre deep learning, uh, you know, reinforcement learning scenarios, we invented this uh, technique called Monte Carlo tree search, which uh, search searches through evolving states of games. So here's the idea. Let, let's say you have a, a scenario. I, I'm going to show you an example in just a second. I'm going to show you the example of tic tac toe. Uh, but suppose you have a scenario in which you are. Uh, like, like you, you have a game state and you are taking actions in the game state which leads you down some branch you know, uh, of evo evolution, right? And of course, the search space is very, very large. And you want to know what the best strategy is, right? Now, one thing you can try to do is to exhaustively search through every search strategy. But again, that may be impossible if the, if the search space is too big. So how do you decide, you know, what what uh, actions to evaluate and which ones to basically discard. And so Monte Carlo tree search is a technique that's been around for a long time that uses Monte Carlo sampling to basically try to evaluate the goodness of, of particular branch of a game state. And the, the, um, the idea is that, okay, let's say you're here, you're, you're at the root of this tree and we want to, we want to figure out what, what's our next move, right? So you the the framework of the algorithm it's cyclical it goes like this you select the branch right wherever you are from the root you expand that branch to some new child node that you have not yet analyzed and then you will simulate a random game basically like you will simulate it all the way to the end and you'll see if you win and or not and if you uh, and then whatever the signal is, win is let's say plus one and loss is minus one. You take that signal and you back propagate it back up the tree, and then at every uh, at every layer of the tree, you are improving its knowledge of how good that branch is, right? Um, something like that. Let me let me show you actually a concrete example. Will be in the next slide is the, uh, of Monte Carlo tree search. Uh, so something like tic tac toe. Okay. Let's say we're trying to design an agent to play tic-tac-toe, okay? Now, tic-tac-toe has something as 765 possible game states, uh, 765 possible games. So very, very small. You can actually exhaustively search the entire space of tic-tac-toe games manually. So this is not actually a good scenario, but it's easy for us to understand, so we'll use it anyway. Suppose we could analyze all of them. So here's the idea. Let's say you have the games, you're at some game state, you're X. 
and there and this is the game state you have to make the next move right um, where should you move right you have you have all of these possible options right there's five empty there's five empty positions so you could put the X here you could put it here um, you know there there basically this is all the options we have so which one should we choose so um, we need some signal to tell us which which of these are good so what we can do is we can we can for each of these uh, like play out a random game so like let's say for s01 we choose this one and then we play out some random game both players until the end and we see that we win right so this is a plus one and we can take this plus one and project it back up the tree and this gets a plus one and right and we do this for all of them so maybe some of them get plus one maybe some of them get minus one and you know you get some signal so here's the number of times we went into each game a random a random game like through this branch and this is how many well this was the points that we received so this one got a plus one this one uh, was a draw this one's a minus one minus one zero well okay we got a plus one here so we should select this game right because we got a plus one and the other ones we didn't right now it's a very weak signal right because we played a random game but it's better than no signal at all right if you do a lot of random games then if the game position is somewhat better for you you should experience more wins than losses right uh, it's a weak signal but it is a signal right so you can do this many times right and you start to get a signal for for the game states now the question is how to actually do the selection right so how do we select which game states to uh, to evaluate given that we have finite set of time and resources to actually do it so the the classical way is to basically optimize this equation this equation is, um, I forget what it's, what it's called, but basically like you, you can more or less read, read this what it is. It's proportional to, okay, the, like we, okay, we, here, here's the idea. We have to balance exploration and exploitation, right? This is the, ex, the classic exploration versus exploitation problem. Exploitation says if we have a branch that, we, that, is, that has a relatively high success rate, we want to we want to ex, uh, go into that more because it seems like it's our best bet, and so we want to evaluate it more and more, like get more sub branches within that branch, right? But uh, we have to balance that with the compel with with the equally compelling need to explore under uh, with, with those game states that have low rollout counts, like low game uh, low simulation counts, because maybe there's some part of the game space that we didn't evaluate yet, so like. One way is to evaluate it based on each, each of the ch child nodes that you have to use this formula, which is proportional to the success rate. So that's W divided by N. W is the number of wins and N is the number of simulations. So if it has a high success rate, that, that number will go up. And so it will be more likely to be, um, to be selected. That's the exploitation part. But then you also add this term that is actually proportion, inversely proportional to the number of uh, times that it has been uh, played. So if you, you can calculate this out, it's the natural log of the percentage of the uh, simulations belonging to that child. And then, um, and then C is some parameter that you set. If C is higher, then you want to do more exploration. If C is low, then you do very little exploration, right? And uh, there's a theoretical, uh, theor theoretically, like if you want to provide the optimal, C is actually square root of two, this can be derived. Uh, but maybe in practice, like may you might actually choose it in in based on some empirical, um, it, like it's root two because it, based on statistics, like the maximizing the expectation of this. But in practice, it's usually chosen empirically or maybe, maybe in some states you, maybe for some games you actually care more about exploring more or less. In any case, that's the way Monte Carlo Tree Search does this uh, handle selection, right? So all of these can be scored, okay? Sub branches can be scored using uh, using this formula. And oh, I think I'm missing a slide here. So you you could score these, and basically whichever one has the highest score, you select that one to do a random playout, right? Um, and and so that's more or less Monte Carlo Tree Search. Now, okay, for things like tic tac toe. Okay, tic-tac-toe is, is stupid because you don't, you definitely don't need to do, uh, you could just simulate the entire thing. But for, for let's say something like Connect 4 or like um, 
some other kinds of board games that have large but relatively limited uh, search spaces, then, uh, then um, you know, Monte Carlo Tree Search has some virtues, but it also has some weaknesses. So for games with a very large branching factor, a very large amount of game states, what does that sound? Is there a parade or something? Oh, really? That's it. Okay. Anyway, um, so um, that's a great sound system, huh? It's like really. Anyway, so for games with very large search spaces, the, uh, and then uh, Monte Carlo Tree Search can actually be um, can, can be not enough, right? Because okay, what happens when your 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 search space is really large? Well, what happens is then then our signal becomes weaker and weaker because we're doing random playouts, right? I mean, it's based on some measure of success, but in the beginning, it's pretty random. And so it's a very weak signal. You're not evaluating very many branches. And so you have kind of like random playouts giving you like a barely better than noise signal uh, of like how good a game state is. So that's the problem with when the search space is very large. The way to improve the search space uh, the efficiency of Monte Carlo tree search is is in two ways. You want to reduce the breadth of the search, which is like the the well the exploration, right? That's the like how many branches. Like maybe maybe these six these five branches, right? The top ones. Maybe we can figure out quickly that three of them are actually really bad. Like, is there some way to estimate quickly estimate that a, a particular search is not not worth exploring? Um, in a way that's better than just the raw score. So that's, that's, the, that's cutting off the search space in, uh, in terms of its width or its breadth. And then you also would like some way of cutting off the depth of the search by trying to estimate how good a particular position happens to be. Rather than, ca rather than playing it out until the end, can you actually stop, you know, instead of playing the game to the end and getting just a plus one, or a minus one, can you estimate how good, how how likely that position is to lead to victory? So that would cut off the depth of the search. Um, so so that's the idea. We want to try to improve the efficiency of, of Monte Carlo tree search by by estimating the value of a position uh, using using something besides for random rollouts. Ro they're called rollouts or playouts, um, something like that. So so let's take a case study. Uh, go, okay. Um, now, two and a half years ago, how many people here are familiar with the story of AlphaGo, which we're going to talk about right now? This was big news in the machine learning world. Um, a, a DeepMind, once again, uh, that company DeepMind was able to was able to create a reinforcement learning agent. In fact, that was able to beat the world's top ranked Go player. And Go happens to fit under the framework that we've introduced very very nicely. Uh, it's in some sense, it's like tic-tac-toe, right? You basically, there's two players, you have a board, and you put down random pieces, uh, not random, you put down pieces on the board positions, right? You take turns, right? And once you put down the piece, uh, it, it always stays there. Actually, I have, this is this slide. So for, for people not familiar with the game of Go, Go is a, a very ancient game. It's like 3,000 years old. I think there's something like 40, I think 40 million players or something like that. It's a really, really popular game. Uh, it's mostly popular in East Asia, so it's, it's kind of analogous to chess in East Asia. And the idea, the, the, the Go is actually has really simple rules, it's incredibly simple. Uh, it's as simple as tic-tac-toe in that sense. Uh, basically the rules are players take turns alter, uh, placing white and black stones on a uh, board which is usually 19 by 19, sometimes it's smaller. And once the uh, once the pieces are down are put down, they, they never they never um, you don't move. It's not like chess where you move the stones around; they just stay there. And the uh, the goal, the objective of the game is to basically surround empty territories with your stones or capture uh, uh, your opponent's stones in circles, right? And uh, although the rules of the game are simple, there's uh, it has such a large like uh, state space that there's a ton of strategy into the, in the game that you just you can't really evaluate these uh, these board positions very easily. And so this has been played for, for a very long time. 
and uh, and in some senses, it, like it, like I said, it's kind of like tic tac toe, right? You you instead of X's and, and O's, you have black stones and white stones, but you put down the piece; it never moves, and you're trying to uh, you're trying to reach some objective. In this case, it's it's accumulating points. Now, um, if you try to approach Go with a simple Monte Carlo tree search, that is, uh, it's not going to work very well. Now, why is it not going to work? Uh, okay, well, consider this. This is this is really crazy. Like number of Go positions there are. So there's 765 tic-tac-toe boards. There's uh, the number of grains of sand on Earth is something like 18-digit number. The number of atoms in the universe is an 80-digit number, and the number of Go boards is a 170-digit number. So there's there's a 170 a number that's 170 digits long. That's the roughly the number of Go boards that you legal Go boards there are. So it's really 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 large. So yeah. How? Yeah. Uh, you should ask physicists. I don't know. I think. I think. I think. Like. I, I like. I don't. I don't know. Like. I, it's obviously. It's an estimate. It's not like. It's not like someone counted them. But I think you can. You can figure it out because there's ways of measuring the amount of mass yeah. in the world, like based on actually, like, like. Uh, yeah. The the great. Yeah. Like. I don't know. Like. I don't know. Like, <laughs> I mean, okay, you you try to figure out like how much dirt there is in terms of in terms of mass. Like, geologists have a pretty solid uh, idea of like how to <laughs> measure that. And then, okay, you divide by the by the amount of mass in a single grain of sand. I don't know, <clears throat> I don't know but they they figured out. So I I think it could be like maybe it's ten to the seventy eighth or something like that. So it could be off by a factor of a hundred. But like, okay, if it's seventy eight digits versus eighty digits. It's probably like for our purposes, it's more or less. It's a lot, basically. It's like really large. So uh, in any case, the number of go boards is like way bigger. Um, it's it's you know, uh, what is that? Ninety orders of magnitude more than numbers of atoms in the universe. So what what what's the problem with running Monte Carlo tree search on Go by itself, right? Well, if you do random playouts, random playouts are going to be like basically putting pieces randomly down and then measuring eventually whether you win or not. So um, you obviously are, are going to get very, very few games, a uh, very low percentage of games from a particular branch. And so the signal is very, very weak, right? Um, so Monte Carlo tree search would just like, you just can't learn like very, very well. Um, and so by itself, it's not going to work, right? So again, like, like the way that we would want to approach this would be to would be okay improving Monte Carlo tree search. This is what we mean, right? We have to we have to improve Monte Carlo tree search by trying to estimate the value of a position without having to do playouts because the playouts are very weak signal, and maybe try to uh, eliminate a lot of branches very quickly. Also, more or less estimating the value of that position, right? So, enter AlphaGo, right? So, uh, this was a a Go playing AI that was developed by DeepMind. And uh, it was thought in the early 2000s, I think people, or like in the late 2000s, people thought that we could solve Go, you know, like projecting current standards by uh, by actually much later. Like we basically beat Go ahead of schedule. Uh, it was supposed to be like in the 2020s that like we thought that we would actually beat it. And it turns out that we did much better very quickly. And the story of AlphaGo is that DeepMind developed this this uh, this computer, and they first challenged a professional player in 2015. They beat the world's top, uh, Euro the European like the basically the top European player Fan Hui, and they published the results in Nature. So this was when when um, AlphaGo was first published in Nature, and uh, uh, Fan Fan Hui is like this. Um, he he he's the top European player, but he's ranked like 700th in the world. So like. So like at this point, they were still like, they were considered peanuts, you know? Um, and uh, this is what, uh, what Fan said about AlphaGo. Very strong and stable, it seems like a wall. I know AlphaGo is a computer, but if no one told me, maybe I would think the player was a little strange, but a very strong player, a real person. Um, well, what's really cool about Go, and, and you know, I wasn't, wasn't really familiar, I'm a big chess fan, and so I wasn't really familiar with Go before this. But I, I was looking at the culture of, of Go, and there's all this sort of intuition. Um, people talk about it with this, these sort of intu, intu, intuitions, because uh, chess, 
the action state space of chess is much smaller than Go. It's quite large, but it's much smaller. And so there's a lot more constraints, kind of. And so it's a very, very like deeply analytical game. And of course, Alpha Go, uh, Go is also very analytical, but there's but at some point, like humans can't evaluate all the positions either. And so they kind of rely on intuition. They know these patterns. They kind of see like a pattern of pieces put in a particular arrangement and they go, oh, well, like it's, it's very common to hear Go players talk in these very abstract terms. Like I felt I felt the board was in this position and I needed to play this this piece, something like that. Um, which is which is kind of neat because, and we'll see in a few slides, like why that's kind of neat because because AlphaGo is doing something very similar, as you'll see in a moment. Okay, so that was in 2015, and then what they did was, oh, okay, then I'll, I'll get to Alpha um, 2016 in a second, but let me describe how AlphaGo works. So, okay, you start with a base layer of Monte Carlo tree search, and you improve it in the following ways, and this is going to make total sense to you because we have covered convolutional ne neural networks to death. And so we know what, what they do um, very well. So the idea is that they dug up about 100,000 human professional Go games, right? The actual, you know, so, so you have 100,000 games times, I think a Go game typically lasts something like 200 moves. So 200 times 100,000 uh, is the number of board positions they had. And they trained two convolutional neural networks to do two different things. The first one is the policy network. Remember we talked about this notion of a policy. It's like, which move should I make? What the policy network does is it tries to predict what the next move would be. Because you have this data set of games played by human players where you have a board position and then you have the next board position, right? So you can actually try to approach it like predicting what is, the, what is a human player likely to do with the next move. So basically you have, you have this, like here you have the board position. It's like an image, right? You have a 19 by 19 grid of pixels, right? So it's more or less like an image. Um, the way it's actually encoded is that there's a layer for white, there's a layer for black, uh, and there's a layer for, uh, well, is it? Yeah, I guess it's two layers. Yeah, yeah. Or do they have a neutral layer? I forget, you'd have to read the paper. But anyway, like the, you encode the board position as an image, and then it's an image to image problem, basically. It's like picks to picks. You're trying to learn, this is, the, look at the left one. You're trying to learn the probability of the next move, right? So probability of the, of the next move, that's the policy network. You can use the policy network to eliminate the, bre the breadth of the search. So here, remember we were like looking at all five branches, but you, you go like a lot of these moves, humans don't seem very likely to make. So why not, well, let's just bother, let's not even bother evaluating them, we'll just go We'll eliminate the breadth of that search and we'll go into the ones that we know about. So that's the policy network. And then the value network is a classifier, uh, or, or actually it's a regression, sorry. It's a regression problem, which also takes a board position and predicts the value of that board. And the value of the board is basically the probability of victory, right? And again, you, you have that encoded in all the games. You know who won the game. You have all these board positions. And so you can train like, okay, this board position had a probability of, of this much of winning. So that's your, that can eliminate the search. So what you have is you now have a Monte Carlo tree search where instead of doing random playouts, you can at some point maybe, maybe do like a bit of a playout, but then stop it at some point and then look at the board position and apply the value network to give you, to give you basically what, what was W in the, the previous slide, like the probability of winning. So that cuts off the depth. And then you have the policy network to cut off the breadth. And so now your search space is uh, like gigantically pruned, right? Using these policy networks and the value networks. And by the way, notice that the policy network, you could use it as a Go player by itself, right? It just predicts the next move. And it predicts it pretty well. Like I think they said 57% of the time it could predict the next move. So the policy network would probably beat all of us. Like, or I don't know if anyone here is good at Go. Like I would, you know, the policy network by itself would beat me. That's for sure. Um, but they, but by itself, it can't defeat the world's top players. But here's, here's the rub. Um, so then, and this is where things get really crazy. So you have this policy network, you have this value network, you have Monte Carlo tree search, you have a pretty good Go player, Go player, but it's still not the best. So what they do is they uh, improve the network using self-play. So this is the reinforcement learning part. 
So the, they they take this this month this like augmented Monte Carlo tree search, and they just play millions. Of, they simulate millions of random games, where the network is playing against itself. It's choosing the 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 the, the um, positions the the moves for both black and white, and so it plays itself millions of times, and then as as it does, uh, it is able to backpropagate the results of the those games you know who won to in, to fine tune the value in the policy network so they basically just train it uh, over like they basically improve it using this sort of self play reinforcement learning strategy it's really really wild right and so these three ingredients uh, or four ingredients i guess is alphago in a nutshell and you can read the nature article and it goes into somewhat more detail but that's basically what AlphaGo is. So, finally, we get to March 2016. This was a big moment. Like, this is very dramatic. So, like, uh, <laughs> forgive me for the drama of these slides. There's actually there's an excellent movie that they made. Um, the, I think it's on, you can find it. It's on YouTube actually. It's on Netflix. But also, if you look up the um, AlphaGo movie, someone just like post. I don't know if it's still up because I guess it's a pirated or whatever it has it has um chinese subtitles so i assume that it's pirated anyway um you it, um you, they they put the, the movie is really great um it's like a documentary it's like dramatized and everything but anyway uh so basically alpha go so deep mind challenged the uh world's most decorated go player lisa doll um so lisa doll is basically he was at the time of the match the number two player in the world uh, he had been number one before, but he's basically like the historically best uh, Go player. And um, and then I, I really love this quote. He said, I will do my best to play a beautiful and interesting game. And again, like there's this, there's this, there's this sort of like in Go, people, people talk about games being beautiful. And, you know, beautiful is sort of an aesthetic thing. It's like what the board looks like. And, and you, you don't hear this terminology so much in chess. Um, so I kind of really like this quote. Yeah. Did they? Um, uh, so when um, uh, I think the the book Moneyball came out, everyone talked about how they uh, the way that that the, the Oakland A's ended up playing baseball for that season was very different from the rest of uh, the baseball other baseball teams because they played uh, they essentially did a sort of a, a data based uh, like uh, approach to baseball, whereas other teams were still quote unquote trying to play like beautiful baseball sure um and uh, and it made and, and be, as a result they uh, they were very successful even though they had you know less um less popular players are they discovering that that you know people are playing go in a particular way that is less uh, yes successful? i have a slide about that later so so hold that thought um so anyway like they challenged lisa doll and uh, the results of it was that AlphaGo beat Lee Sedol four out of the five games. It won the first three, and and actually, like if you watch the movie, like oh my god, like humanity was demoralized because actually Lee Sedol thought he he was like he really thought it, like AlphaGo was no match. So he's like, I'll definitely win five zero, and then after three zero, it was like, wow, this thing is like, this is really, this is really bad, like for for our species, like we we like go is falling to the machines, and then actually like uh, Lee won in game four, um, by uh, the the they he exp he basically tried some experimental strategy that AlphaGo that made AlphaGo quote unquote delusional, as as um as DeepMind put it. And so they ended up winning game four. It was very, very, um, it was kind of like redeeming for humans, basically like redeem the whole species. Uh, but in any case, like, and then, and then Alpha won game five. So uh, four to one, so Go fell to the machines, right? Um, so, well, there, I don't really have a happy ending for this. It's like, <laughs> it's like, like Go is over, that's it. Okay, but things, things that was where things um, left off. That was already two years ago. Uh, they didn't stop, um, so AlphaGo has not enjoyed as much press um, as as that game provided. But actually, like they've continued to develop it, and in ways that are incredibly interesting. So the next thing, first of all, they they first made something called AlphaGo Master, which was able to beat the world's number one player, um, and then and then uh, and that was I don't know they made minor, relatively minor adjustments. 
But then the next really big thing that came along was AlphaGo Zero. AlphaGo Zero is, uh, has the following improvements. So the first two are the relatively minor things, and, the, and then the, um, the third one is the biggest. So, the, so first of all, the policy and value network were actually combined into a single neural network that evaluates both the policy and the value. They eliminated all handcrafted features. So there was almost zero handcrafted features in AlphaGo. Um, the one that beat Lee, but they had a few uh, handcrafted features, which are basically statistics, like uh, how many of your, how many of your uh, like uh, opponent stones do you have encircled, and so on. These kinds of statistics, they got rid of those completely, and so then the input data is just the board position, and again, this is all in in the hopes of trying to make the thing generalized, right? And then here's the biggest one: no training data. So remember, it had these 100,000 games that they used to train the value network and the policy network before going into self-play. So they got rid of the training data and they, and they have the network start from scratch. So basically, it goes directly into self-play with, with, with in complete, like completely uh, scratch, from scratch. Now, now think about why this is so difficult. Like, okay, if the network has no idea what to do, in the beginning, it's just playing like random, completely randomly against itself, just putting pieces down wherever, right? And so, uh, the the problem with reinforcement learning is, is that like when the when the reward signal is so weak, uh, it can be really the training can be very unstable, right? Because the signal is okay. You put down the piece, and you want to know how good that that piece is, right? But your opponent is playing randomly, right? So like. So it's, it's not really, it doesn't really give you a very good um, idea of whether or not that move was very good until, until the network is actually pretty good already, right? So, the net, so training stabilizes once the network is at a, at a particular level. But in the beginning, it's just random pieces. And so it can be really, really difficult to train this, right? However, they figured out how to do it. And, um, and that's really important because, okay, why, why is it important to get rid of training data? and handcrafted features, right? We want these things to generalize. We want it to be a single algorithm that we can apply to many other kinds of things. And uh, often those things that we want to apply to don't even have training data. Like we don't even have necessarily training data sets for all the problems that we want to attack. And so it's it, it's very, very, um, you know, to, to actually um, handicap ourselves in this way is actually very valuable, right? Uh, then, uh, so they were able to beat the world number one player, and they also went 16-0 against top human professionals. And uh, the number one player, K KG, said, when I first saw it, I thought it was almost an impossible... So he's talking about one of the moves that Alpha, Alpha Go Zero made. And he said, when I first saw it, I thought it was almost an impossible move for human players to come up with, since it's obviously a later step. But afterward, I realized it was really an astonishing move. So I think this is getting to... Uh, I'll have a slide about this in a second, but like they start to come up with strategies that humans ha hadn't ever thought of, right? So that's really interesting. And they basically have this plot that shows how good AlphaGo Zero... So AlphaGo Zero exceeded AlphaGo Lee, which is the network that, that, um, that beat uh, Lee Sedol, in five days of training. And then it exceeded AlphaGo Master, which beat KG, in something like 40 days. Um, be, because it really, like, at this point, it starts to get harder and harder. You get diminishing returns, right? And then it was the best player in the world by by around 40 days, right? And it beat, uh, they played AlphaGo 0 against AlphaGo Master, and it was 100 no against AlphaGo Master. So so the thing just keeps on getting better. So at this point, basically, like, Go is unbeatable, like, by humans. Um, so, okay, now this is getting more, more to this, right? And I... Um, so I, I really like this quote by, there's a, a chess grandmaster named Viktor Korchnoi, who's um, supposedly some people think he's the best chess player to never be number one in the world. Uh, but he has this great quote, I don't study, I create, right? So the, this is kind of very much, I think describes AlphaGo Zero, that it basically like, it doesn't study games, it just creates them and then it learns completely originally how to, how to play. And uh, this is what's called tabula rasa learning, blank slate, right? That's Latin for blank slate. And what they describe, and you can watch, you can read the paper and, and watch some talks by David Silver, who's kind of the chief scientist who worked on it. And he talked about how AlphaGo Zero starts to rediscover knowledge 
So there, there's a number of known sequences and known patterns that are written about, you know, just like in chess, they're written about, you know, sequences that repeat over and over in human games called Joseki patterns. And AlphaGo Zero actually rediscovers them. So it starts to play them. But then as it gets better and better, it actually begins to discard some of them and play patterns that humans had never played, right? So it's, it's, it's really telling us, it's now beginning to, to really tell us more about the game of Go that we've, we haven't actually discovered. So that's, that's really cool, right? So it removes the dependency and human expertise and the program generalizes to other games. So that's AlphaGo Zero. Now, the fact that I can generalize to other games is, of course, that was the whole point. So Alpha Zero, so as compared to Alpha Go Zero, Alpha Zero was then the evolution of Alpha Go Zero into a general purpose algorithm that can learn other games. And they applied it to chess, shogi, and chess and shogi. Uh, shogi is basically Japanese chess, I, th I think, more or less. And, uh, and they, in both cases, along with Go, became the world's top player very quickly. Uh, and here they're comparing it against the, the top engines. Uh, what's like in chess, the top engine pre-Alpha Zero uh, is Stockfish. Stockfish is this software that's basically the world's top chess engine, at, or was the world's top chess engine. And it was able to exceed uh, Stockfish in some amount, I forget, in like four days of training. And then Elmo is the best uh, shogi computer. Uh, both Stockfish and Elmo are unbeatable by humans. Uh, chess fell to the machines in 1997. So um, that was deep, uh, deep blue. I have That's the next slide here. So let's talk about chess. And this is, this is where, where I'm going to get very excited because I was a big chess player growing up. Um, and I remember, who remembers 1997 when, when deep blue, IBM's computer beat Garry Kasparov, who was at the time the top chess player in the world. Still to this day, he has the number two ranking of all humans ever. And he lost the deep blue, and 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 now, and but it's not like they stopped, right? Chess engines continue to be developed, and 20 years later, chess engines are totally unbeatable. They have their own tournaments, right? They're like a completely different league. Uh, grandmasters actually prepare with chess engines. Chess engines are used all over the place. They're used for analyzing games. They're used for helping uh, grandmasters prepare. And there's also this uh, this genre of matches where it's like. Uh, centaur matches where, where you play with a chess engine. So it's like human plus chess engine plus a better chess engine. So these kinds of games are, are also like a thing. And the current top chess engine is Stockfish, whose uh, ranking, ELO score basically, um, is estimated at 3,300, which is around 500 points more than the top ranked human, uh, who's Magnus Carlsen. By the way, the chess uh, championships are happening right now. The, the number one, number two player are playing against each other. They've drawn all of their games. So it's, it's, it's 12, 12 games, 12 draws, and now they have to go into tiebreaker, basically, uh, which favors Carlsen. Uh, in any case, Carlsen is not only the best player in the world, but he's also the best player ever. He has the highest rating in the world, but he couldn't possibly, like, they just don't beat engines anymore. Um, so, you able to go back? so you're able to go backwards and say, oh, probabilistically, you should have done this, not that. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, they, they that's how that's what they use. Yeah, so so they actually use uh, these engines to an analyze games. So uh, so that's what what chess was uh, twenty years ago, and uh, like I said, like Deep Blue. Now now let's consider this, right? The, how are chess engines made? They're they classically they're made using these techniques that basically are are all human knowledge encoded into expert rules, right? So. Um, this is just a list of all of the things that are programmed as, into Stockfish. There's other engines too, like Ribka, Co Komodo. They're basically these, um, they, they have tournaments to decide which engine is the best, and Stockfish is the best right now. But in any case, like they, they usually, they have all sorts of things encoded into them. You can read about, um, you can read a lot about what goes into them, but it's a lot of like expert rules. And, and you know, they're Stockfish, Komodo, Ribka, they only play chess. Like, this is like very chess specific. And actually, like, if you read about how Deep Blue was made, they, they, so it was something like they got 50 grandmasters into a room to decide on the function that could evaluate a board position. And it would, it would tabulate all of these statistics, like how many of your opponent's pieces do you have in check? How many of your pieces are in check? 
Um, you know, what is the safety of the king? There's all these statistics that they came up with, right? Like, like what are the things that humans look for? And uh, they made this as, and it was basically what the value network does, right? It's this thing that would take a bunch of statistics on the board and then use that to, to uh, improve the, the uh, Monte Carlo tree search. That was basically deep blue. And more or less, the the uh, the engines nowadays, they're I think they're somewhat more sophisticated. I don't know too much about how Stockfish works, but they're more or less variations of that, with a lot more rules encoded into them. And Alpha Zero comes along, has no rules encoded into it, doesn't even know what the rules of the game are, um, and and basically is able to beat them after a few hours of self play. So um, Alpha Zero plays against Stockfish. Remember, Stockfish cannot be beaten by human beings. It's it's just it's like if you you can play stockfish online uh, and you know maybe it's a lesser version of stockfish but the top stockfish like it's just absolutely like you can't even draw against it right so alpha zero played against stockfish and they played a hundred matches and alpha zero was 28 and 0 against stockfish they had 72 draws mostly when um mostly when stockfish had the white pieces um, it's it's harder to win as black in chess because you move second. It's like 52%, 48%, something like that. Uh, but I want to show you a few interesting games. So you can, uh, there's a really awesome chess channel on YouTube. Uh, this guy, Agadmator, who does, who does analyses of chess is really awesome. I want you to look at this position that AlphaGo puts Stockfish in. This is what's called a Zugzwang. Um, in chess, Zugzwang, that's a German word, which basically, or German for like cannot move. It's basically a position where you know you want to you want to have the turn to move in chess, right? But sometimes you cannot move because any move that you make will will make your position worse. So here, Stockfish is in the black pieces. They can't move the king because it will get checkmated. Can't move the queen. It'll lose the queen. Cannot move this rook or this rook because then it'll lose the pawn and then certain checkmate is coming. You got the bishop here eyeing this piece and then you got the queen and the rook here. Just cannot move the rooks at all. You can move the pawns, but then basically they'll just get eaten. Like they're not going anywhere. So it, it's really awesome that like you can not only like beat Stockfish, but humiliate it. Like like I mean, like this is a position that's really hard to get an uh, like a computer into. And there's also like okay, like uh, I think I have yeah. This is great. I want to show you this. This is also a piece that was analyzed. Like oh yeah, that's let me show you this game this is a really great piece so game eight here I was watching this analysis and basically like okay we were talking about um, like strategies right and in this game the alpha they, the alpha go and stockfish both of them they they often oh, what's going on here uh, okay well yeah let's just look at this so they often come up with strategies that that more or less play like humans like this is a known sequence uh that you can read about like grandmasters play the sequence and it, it's basically these are predictable games for the first you know so for the first you know 10 15 moves of the game but here's where things go crazy alpha go plays a move actually sacrifices a pawn and then does a move this move right here moves the pawn to b4 no human had ever done this after this sequence this sequence has been played many hundreds or thousands of times and no human ever did this because basically they they more or less sacrificed the pawn in doing so so what's the idea is that if you fast forward basically this bishop is stuck this bishop is stuck and it's going to be stuck there for the whole rest of the game you could just watch this like the bishop can never get out of there you go and it just like it just suffocates like <laughs> stockfish. Maybe I'm being a little too much of a dork about this, but <laughs> basically the the thing that repeats all the time is that stockfish is able to see things like or sorry alpha zero sees things like you see the the bishop is still stuck can't get can't go anywhere. It sees things like 50 moves ahead of schedule, you know, and it, and it's able to do these crazy sacrifices and then yeah it wins eventually. Basically there's no chance like these pawns are gonna go queen eventually and there's just no stopping alpha go here. Or, or alpha zero so it's really it's really like it's it's crazy stuff like what's going on here <laughs> anyway um and and yeah i want to mention like they did this analysis both for go and for chess where they they look at this the um the uh how often they play certain openings and you'll see in these graphs that uh, like as it 
trains for longer and longer, it, be, it rediscovers human openings and then slowly begins to discard them because it doesn't like them. So like Al, uh, Alpha Zero doesn't like the French defense. Like at first, the French defense is like a very commonly um, used like opening sequence and, and Alpha Zero eventually was like, you know what, Ch French defense doesn't work. And so it stopped playing it. And the same thing for, for Go, it discovers these Yoseki patterns and then it, begins to, it, then it begins to actually like disfavor some of them. So all of that is like is is really crazy, and so like the the beauty of this is that like what they say is that you know Alpha Zero, Alpha Go, and uh, Alpha Go Zero and Alpha Chess Zero they're really beginning to to show us things that we never knew. Like they're really beginning to learn how to play these games, and and we're learning a lot from them. And so maybe they can do that in other domains. You know, like really really begin to 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 like come up with new knowledge that that we just haven't been able to find. Now, believe it or not, it gets a lot harder <laughs> when you begin to approach games like that, that uh, like this. This is, so like you know, uh, both OpenAI and 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 uh, DeepMind are onto things like uh, StarCraft, um, Dota, uh, Defense of the Arts. Right? I think this is a really popular video game, and these are actually even you know like approaching it the same way that you approach Go. You have a pixels right you're trying to and you have a reward signal which is you know how much if you're winning the game and then learning how to play it and and here it's much more complicated because you have uh, in go and chess you have what's called perfect information you see the whole board all the time it doesn't move right in these games you actually don't have perfect information you're you're limited by your viewpoint and there's a lot more pixels there's a lot more complexity to these games and so they haven't yet started winning at them but they're getting they're starting to get there um, so this is kind of in the pipeline, and and actually they recently had pre some pretty good success against Dota, the top Dota players in the world, under certain handicaps. Like they actually, uh, I think they say that DeepMind is given some advantages. Like they're, you know, it's not it's not exactly tabula rasa, but um, but eventually maybe we'll be we'll be beating these games just as well. Oh, a few more things. We're getting close to the end here. I wanna I'm gonna mention this because this is kind of like fits the theme of the class. This is some work um, uh, in basically curiosity-driven exploration. So reinforcement learning where there's no reward, there's no intrinsic reward, but instead the, the goal is to basically satiate your curiosity. So it's basically, it's an agent that's playing Mario and the goal is to just be driven by curiosity. And they define curiosity as the inability to predict the consequences of your actions, which I think is a, like a really nice way of explaining curiosity. And so this is what it looks like. This is basically Mario trying to satiate his curiosity. So yeah, rewards are either extremely sparse or absent altogether. So like one intrinsic reward is an intrinsic curiosity. So he discovers how to play Mario Brothers without any rewards. Right. So for, I don't know why Mario loves jumping. Like it's like just keeps jumping. Yeah. Same same a uh, different level. Loves jumping. Yeah. And tormenting the Koopas. <laughs> He's <laughs> like, what am I doing? <laughs> yeah. Anyway, um, that's pretty cool. Um, okay, so a few practical things that I want to mention. So if you're interested in doing some reinforcement learning stuff, we don't have, uh, I, I, I didn't prepare any tutorials, but there are a bunch of things online that, are, that actually look quite accessible. So this, this is a Medium post with Python code for using Keras. I think it's using Keras. Uh, or maybe it might just be TensorFlow, I forget. But in, in any case, it, um, it's basically how to build your own Alpha Zero. And uh, instead of playing Chess or Go, which are really, really like too big, they start with playing Connect 4, this game Connect 4, which, which is much simpler, but it actually it has a relatively large state space. So it actually turns out to capture the right balance of like uh, difficult, but also like easy enough to compute. Um, so this is basically how to build your own Alpha Zero. You can find here. I'll put these slides online so you can, or you can also just look up like, okay, build your own Alpha Zero in Python. You'll find it. Uh, but I'll put the slides online. You'll get the links. 
Um, this is, uh, I wanted to mention like OpenAI, uh, really, really active. Both OpenAI and DeepMind are kind of the big players in reinforcement learning. And they have something called spinning up in deep RL. This is from, I think they released this just like, like maybe two months ago. And it's basically a big framework of, of uh, code repositories that, that do like basic deep learning implementations. They also have like a lot of like educational materials. So like they have curated lists of papers of important research topics in RL um, and some exercises and so on. So this is like a really, really good place to, to start if you want to begin to train your own RL agents. And then, um, and then also, yeah, they also, I think this is nicely integrated with, with the spinning up RL, they have this gym. And gym is basically software for interfacing with video games. So there's all, they have this big database of like simulations of video games that are easily hooked up to their RL uh, repositories. Um, they, there's tons of them. There's like all of these games. You might even recognize some of them. I see Paperboy. See, anyone play this game? <laughs> um, yeah. Then, um, so that's OpenAI Gym. Very much worth it. And then um, there's also you, uh, there's also integration uh, into Unity. I know Aiden's been messing with these. Um, these are basically agents that work inside of Unity. Uh, they're basically AIs that you can train inside of Unity. It's really nicely documented and, and I think is like, uh, I, I, don't, I haven't used it, so maybe Aiden you might, might know, but if anyone wants to use these, yeah, talk to Aiden. Super well documented. Super well documented, yeah. So um, if you are interested in Unity, this is a really good place to, to kind of go. And uh, okay, so that's, that's all on reinforcement learning. Um, next week is the last lecture. And so it's week 11 and basically next week's lecture is going to be devoted to the, the most useless topic to this class. That's why I saved it for last, but also it's basically a preview of my next class here that I'm teaching next semester called Autonomous Artificial Artist. And we're going to talk about um, like a lot of crazy things involving decentralization technology, peer-to-peer -peer networks, how to decentralize machine learning and how to basically put an artist in the cloud, which is my, my, my dream ambition. We're gonna talk about curation markets and decentralized autonomous organizations and all kinds of like fun futuristic things. Um, so next week is not gonna be super practical, but we're gonna talk about like big ideas. And so I hope it's like entertaining to everybody. Um, that's it. Uh, are there any questions on the RL or NLP stuff? Anybody? Yeah, yeah. All right, awesome. Um, okay, so like I said, um, office hours like today. Like if anyone wants to, I'm gonna I'm gonna be around here for a little bit. Then I'm gonna go downstairs for a few hours, and then tomorrow, twelve to five, uh, come to AI Lab on Friday. Um, basically, all that stuff. So, okay, yeah. See you guys next week. Ciao. Oh.